you've had your hand up for a while. I'm going to take your question. You. Lady in the front there. <laughs> Look, my one question is basically, or my one comment, or passing comment, is that so many times you've brought up women in Islam. i just like to correct that I've read the Quran and all Muslim scholars would agree with me that Islam gives women a lot of rights. We over and over give Islam, women in Islam through the Quran, I may not say it through individuals who preach the religion, but Islam through the Quran gives women a lot of rights and I need that to be heard. I need it to, to have everyone to understand and hear that. I mean, Absolutely. I am a young Muslim woman myself. I sit before you, I have a voice and I can speak to you and I can look you in the eye and I do have my rights. And when I go to Iran, I'm actually Iranian as well. So when I go to Iran, I also have my rights. I need it to be heard that the Quran, the Quran, Allah, Subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us our rights. In people, individuals in countries and people who represent our religion may not, and they may do the wrong thing to um, sort of stand in front and show us religion and preach us religion, okay. but Islam does. All right. We're going to take that as a Thank comment, you. a very passionate one at that. Okay. I, well, no. You're, uh, no, no, we're not. No, we're not going to take it as a comment. <laughs> I, can, I can see your face, I can see your hair, and I can see you sitting in an audience with young gentlemen. Don't you tell me you can do any of that in Iran. I can, though. No, you can't. Yes, I can. No, you cannot. I can in Iran. In Iran, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, where I have you been, you wouldn't, my I hair would see your be hair. out. My nope. hair would be out because my veil would be little. My hair would be out. It may be covered a little bit, but just like in, in, oh, in the on. Bible, in the letter to the Corinthians, okay. Okay. it says to cover your no, hair no. to be modest. It's a shame she spoiled what could have been a perfectly be. good statement. Oh, all right, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. The I'm sorry. Modesty would be there. I mean, you've been talking about these cheap, uh, cheap jokes and things throughout have, this if, whole if conversation, you but you're the only one you making insult, the cheap comments. You insult, comments. you insult your sisters in Tehran who are being beaten, who are being beaten and raped every day when you say that they have their rights in the Islamic Republic. It's an insult to the women of Iran. I do not. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hitchens, um, you are likely the, the world's most charming, roguish, and uh, enlightened atheist, and I love you for that. But uh, as a Sufi Muslim, I'm very ruffled by the title of your book. Of all the titles that you likely had at your disposal, did you have to settle for the uh, literal negation of Allahu Akbar? Yes. I thought so. Thank you for that question. Thank you. So it's a very good question. I'm glad I wanted to come well, back to it. Um, Why? Yeah. The, as I've said, I, I think that all religions are wrong in the same way, in, in that they privilege uh, faith over, over reason, but they're not all equally bad in the same way all the time. I mean, if I'd been writing in the 1930s, I would certainly have said that the Roman Catholic Church was the most dangerous religion in the world because of its open alliance with fascism and anti-Semitism, which the damage from that our culture has n never recovered from and, and never will. But at the moment, it's very clear to me that the, the most toxic form that religion takes is the Islamic form. The horrible idea of wanting to end up with Sharia, with a religion-governed state, a state of religious law, and that the best means of getting there is jihad, holy war, and that Muslims have a special right to feel aggrieved enough to demand this, I think is absolute obscene wickedness, and I think their religion is nonsense. And the, the I, entire, I had, in, I its had another, I had another, in its entirety, the, the, the idea of God, God speaks to some illiterate merchant warlord in Arabia, and he's able to write this down perfectly, and it contains the answers to all human. Don't, don't, don't waste my time. It's bullshit. But, but you're saying the same also about that, also that God, that God speaks. The Archangel Gabriel speaks only Arabic, it seems. I this just is, want to say, in retrospect, we were very civil, actually. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> this is, no, this is. Uh, is this, this the is same a characterization a, a, of all wait, religions? Well, then? actually, no, because remember, Islam makes one special claim for itself. All religions claim to be revealed truth. They, they all, all are founded by divine revelation. But Islam rather dangerously says, ours is the last and final one. There can't be any more after this. This is God's last word. Now, that's straight away a temptation to violence and intolerance. And if you note, it's a temptation they seem quite willing to fall for. Re Rabbi, Second, do you have any call? I had another motive, yes. another motive, which is this. If you remember Dick Gregory, the older comrades here will, great black comedian and civil rights activist, when he came to write his memoir, he called it nigger. Right. It upset a lot of people, including his old mum, who called him and said, why are you doing this? And he says, mama, every time you hear that word again, they're selling my book. <laughs> <laughs> so every, every Allahu Akbar reminds people that we're in a very serious struggle with a very depraved religion. And there are, are help is available. Friend, you, you, you 
give look, no quarter? I, I look, he believes in the prophecy of Muhammad. I'm sorry to say, I, th I think he's being at best conned. Yeah. Our time is ticking down. Now let's not dance around. Not all monotheisms are exactly the same at the moment. They're all based on the same illusion. They're all plagiarisms of each other. But there's one in particular that at the moment is proposing a serious menace, not just to freedom of speech and freedom of expression, but to quite a lot of other freedoms too. And this is the religion that exhibits the horrible trio of self-hatred, self-righteousness, and self-pity. I'm talking about militant Islam. Globally, it's a gigantic power. Globally, it's a gigantic power. It controls an enormous amount of oil wealth, several large countries and states, uh, with, a, with an enormous fortune. It's pumping the ideology of Wahhabism and Salafism around the world, poisoning societies where it goes, ruining the minds of children, stultifying the young in its madrasas, training people in violence, uh, making a cult of death and suicide and murder. That's what it does globally. It's quite strong. In our societies, it poses as a cringing minority whose, whose faith you might offend, which deserves all the protection uh, that, that a small and vulnerable group might need. Now, it makes quite large claims for itself, doesn't it? It says it's the final revelation. It says that God spoke to one illiterate businessman in the Arabian Peninsula three times through an archangel, and that the resulting material, which as you can see when you read it, is largely plagiarized from the Old and the New Testament. Almost all of it actually plagiarized, ineptly from the Old and New Testament is to be accepted as a divine revelation and as the final and unalterable one and that those who do not accept this revelation are fit to be treated as cattle, infidels, potential chattel, slaves, and victims. Well, I tell you what, I don't think Muhammad ever heard those voices. I don't believe it. And the likelihood that I'm right, as opposed to the likelihood that a shepherd who couldn't, a businessman couldn't, who couldn't read, had bits of the Old and New Testament re-dictated to him by an archangel, I think puts me much more near the position of being objectively correct. But who is the one under threat? The person who promulgates this and says, I'd better listen because if I don't, I'm in danger? Or me, who says, oh, no, I think this is so silly, you can even publish a cartoon about it. And up go the placards, and up go the yells, and the howls, and the screams. Behead those. This is in London. This is in Toronto. This is in New York. It's right in our midst now. Behead those. Behead those who cartoon Islam. Do they get arrested for hate speech? No. Might I get in trouble for saying what I've just said about the Prophet Muhammad? Yes, I might. Where are your priorities, ladies and gentlemen? You're giving away what's most precious in your own society, and you're giving it away without a fight, and you're even praising the people who want to deny you the right to resist it. Shame on you while you do this. Make the best use of the time you've got left. This is really serious. Now, if you look anywhere you like, because we've had invocations of a rather driveling and sickly kind tonight of our sympathy. What about the poor fags? What about the poor Jews, the wretched women who can't take the abuse, and the slaves and their descendants, and the, and the tribes who didn't make it and were told that their land was forfeit? Look anywhere you like for the warrant for slavery, for the subjection of women as chattel, for the burning and, and, and uh, flogging of homosexuals, for ethnic cleansing, for anti-Semitism, for all of this, you look no further than a famous book that's on every pulpit in this city and in every synagogue and in every mosque. And then just see whether you can square the fact that the force that is the main source of hatred is also the main caller for censorship. And when you realize that you're therefore this evening faced with a gigantic false antithesis, I hope that still won't stop you from giving the motion before you the resounding endorsement that it deserves. Thanks awfully. Night night. Stay cool. Returning now to our top story, the outrage in the Muslim world over caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad. Any depictions of Muhammad are offensive to the faithful. But in many Western nations, freedom of expression is a sacred right as well, including the freedom to express offensive ideas. Well, for some perspective on this, I spoke with columnist and author Christopher Hitchens and Ahmed Yunus with the Muslim Public Affairs Council. This is a debate 
they do not pull any punches. And we began by talking about the decision of many media outlets, including CNN, to pixelate the images of Muhammad. Now, I know, as well as you do, that you have not done that in order to avoid sparing the hurt feelings of my uh, fellow guest. You've done it because you're afraid of retaliation and of intimidation. Now, I, I'd like to ask him and anyone else who agrees with him is watching, is that the relationship they want to have with the free press? Because if we have to use this stupid word offensive, those of us who believe in the Enlightenment and the Constitution and the First Amendment are very much offended by this mad babyish conduct. But we don't go out and kidnap the nearest Muslim we can find and take him hostage till someone apologizes. Okay. We, don't, we don't violate diplomatic immunity. We don't, we don't, which is one of the most precious things in the international uh, community, much more precious than the right of Muslims not to have their feelings hurt. Oh, the whole well. thing is a scandal, and we're all running scared from it. Okay, let's let this Ahmed Yunus, uh, Ahmed, jump, jump in here. I know you want to respond. Yeah, absolutely. This is not about uh, hurt feelings. It's about strategic discourse. Uh, the people that we see on TV strategic are... What? The, well, hold on, Christopher. The people that we see on TV are less than 1% of the Muslim masses. The, the, the gravamen of the discussion here is the vast majority of Muslim moderates that are offended from their role in a post-9-11 and in a, in a conflict-oriented situation, which, which is at the apex of counterterrorism, at the apex of an engagement, of a discussion of hearts and minds. Of course, freedom of expression stands, and no one is asking the Danish government to stifle expression. But yes, freedom are. of expression, yes, ho are. hold on, Christopher, freedom of expression and the responsibilities of discussion, the responsibilities of those with power and privilege to ensure that there is comity between different groups, a, a belated response by the government, and then a continuing of republishing and reprinting uh, these cartoons. We have freedom of expression here in the United States, but the president and the major media have chosen not to engage. The Pope believes in freedom of expression, but he has condemned these cartoons. Nobody it's about okay, strategic Chris, Christopher, I want to let Christopher in here. Christopher, I want to I hear... Mean, what is this babble? The State Department uh, <laughs> has said that it apologizes and, th and thinks these things are offensive, and it's um, uh, done so without, as far as I know, any permission from the American people to say that, that we uh, take that view. I'm glad to hear you say it's only 1% of the Muslim world that takes this opinion. In that case, why are we treating the leaders of these lynch mobs and, and bullying gangs as if they were representative of your religion? That's a very good and question. why is it that we can't get condemnation so easily, or at all, when, for example, Shia mosques and funeral processions in Iraq are blown up by Muslim fascists. Well, Christopher, the, the, that vast majority, you? Ahmed Yunus, jump the vast in. majority of Muslims condemn attacks on Shia communities, condemn attacks on Christian communities in name Muslim one, countries. Name one, name one. The Council on American Islamic Relations sent a delegation to Iraq to, uh, to try to uh, release Jill Carroll. We have done the same with Margaret Hassan. Uh, we engage that's continuously. That's hostage trading. That's we not, were, that's, we were that's against that's the Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to jump in here for both of you. Excuse Christopher, me. We Christopher, don't need hang Islamic on. Groups in Christopher, I got to jump in here. Because the, the, the point is made here, and this comes up over and over again, that when we talk about the, the most radical of Muslims, they're the ones who get the attention. The whole of the faith gets painted with this brush by the kinds of pictures we're showing today of burning buildings, as awful as it is. Is there a fair point being made here that this, this clearly is not representative? Absolutely. And if we look, if we Chris, look at Christopher, please. Um, well, that's for Muslims to decide. If they want to condemn this, they can, but actually a lot of Muslim governments have instead, uh, and authorities, they are have instead joined the condemnation of the cartoons and urged the Danish government to bring pressure on uh, the free press in Denmark. Because it's absolutely they are, outrageous. They are opportunists. State actors and non-state actors that are taking this opportunity to pursue their ends is a different discussion. What we are discussing now is why would we offend the very identity of 1.2 billion people who are needed for us to end this era? Ahmed, no, that's Ahmed, not the question. Though, why, that's not the question at all. Why are there anti-Semitic cartoons published all the time Absolutely. in in certain Muslim press and Arab press? Let's talk and about the, the, the anti-Semitic cartoons that sure, are there sure. all the time, and you don't see this kind of reaction You're right. from Jews who may be deeply, deeply offended. You're right. We are all offended, not just Jews. We are all offended with their anti-Semitic cartoons and these dictatorships that use the other to galvanize the bases within their countries to support them in their efforts um, are, are acting contradictory to the interests of Muslims. We condemn that type of anti-Semitic behavior. We condemn it when it's against any other community, be it by Muslims that wasn't like the, the Taliban. Question. That Wait, wasn't on, the question. This is the same Europe that, wasn't that what had, you were being asked. This is the same Europe that had a genocide against Muslims, the largest genocide since the Holocaust. We have got to be strategic. We have got to ensure that we are not negligently bolstering the haters that are finding come on, excuses. Come on. 
Come okay, on. Chris, I'm, I'm well, not just Christopher, a potted, I'm not just a potted plant here. I don't, he wasn't asked that question. He was asked why, when uh, Jewish people or Christians, or, or uh, the largest, in my opinion, the most important uh, uh, group in the world, those of us who don't believe in religion and claim the rights of the Enlightenment, when we're offended, you were asked, why don't we take the occasion to go and set fire to embassies of democratic countries or kidnap civilians. That's what you're being asked. And you're the, still claiming the, you're still claiming Muslims have a special right to be offended. And that is not. very offensive absolutely indeed. Not. Absolutely not. I am claiming that Muslims How have an equal, right, in that an equal right to to find human dignity in the way that they are treated in society. And Christopher, if you feel that there is an attack against you, you have the right to respond. That is the same That's freedom what of I'm speech doing that now. you're Thank saying. You. The, the, the Muslims Without around the world... Without your permission, with on, your interruption, that's okay, what I'm doing. Okay, now. gentlemen, time out here for a second. Time out. Uh, Christopher, I want to go back to, to the first point you made, and that is, you know, how newspapers and news organizations make their decisions about this. And you mentioned, you know, CNN's decision to pixelate these. You're right. I mean, partly based on fear of reprisals against our staff, but also partly based on fear of offending. And I, I want to put it to you this way. I mean, do non-Muslims have any obligation, in your view, to be uh, to, to to be respectful of this aspect of the Muslim faith and to make an extra effort not to offend. Look, I'm not asking for the right to slaughter a pig in a mosque, or to or to de defecate on a Quran, or anything of this kind. I am saying that the religion makes very large claims for itself. Islam claims to, that it is the total solution to all human problems, and this that the is sooner not about Islam. And that the sooner that it's imposed on everyone, the better. Well, that's a point of view, but it can't. If it's going to make such claims, it has to. Uh, drop the demand that it be immune from criticism and especially from satire. To many, to many of us, the claims of the Prophet Muhammad or the, his claim to be a prophet are absurd. Muhammad, and these, uh, that, I, of course, we have the right to do that, just as we have the right to represent unchaste nuns and child raping priests and, okay. other, and the other people who also claim a special right because they claim that their own bigotry is divine. Ahmed Yunus, is why, is this, why this is, is it so different for the Muslim faith? This is a fabricated discussion. This is, the, the issue here is not the freedom of the West and the uh, isolation of the Muslim world. One of the primary goals of Sharia, as studied in classical discourse, is the protection of the products of the mind and the protection of freedom of speech. That's not what we are addressing. We are not asking anyone to follow Islamic law. No one in the world is saying that there should be uh, an inhibition against this type of speech, but what, what we're st saying is those with the ability to move discussions forward for peace, forward for an ability to see each other, they have a More responsibility babble. to act. It is not babble, Mr. Babble. This, babble. this is not the first time. These types of cartoons, this isn't the first time. These types of cartoons, the religious leader of Islam called for the murder uh, in his own name for money of a novelist of living in England who, who wasn't this, a Muslim. Who is this religious leader of Islam? We are Muslims, sir. We all represent ourselves. Our tradition well, has the been Ayatollah clear. Khomeini, the, the Ayatollah tradition, Khomeini doesn't consider, did not consider you okay. as equal, let's say. The tradition of the Prophet is clear. Comity between all people, religious freedom for all people, Nonsense. even those that do not Gentlemen, believe in God. Nonsense. We have to, and we are the vice of that man. We have to leave it there, Nonsense. gentlemen. They claim, I appreciate it. They claim it. a special right, and they claim it by at gunpoint and by force. No, Christopher, sir, that's, must that's the be, last word, gentlemen. Christopher Hitchens and Ahmed Yunus. Offensive. Both of you, it's been Fancy. spirited, it's been interesting, and it's going to continue. That, that much is to be sure. Thank you both Thank you for being here. There was a huge debate recently about whether or not um, women in uh, Britain should be allowed to wear not the shador or the, um, just the scarf, the headscarf, uh, but the all-enveloping veil which only allows a slit of this kind. Whether, uh, well, we should, yes, we should allow it because it's Islamic and because the Quran calls for women to cover their head. Now, the Quran doesn't call for women to cover their head. There's no such call in the Quran. There is probably only one society in the region, now that, now that the Taliban has been removed, namely Saudi Arabia, which calls for women to have their faces covered. If you went out like that in Turkey or in Tunisia, for example, you would actually be arrested. You're not allowed to do it in Muslim societies of this kind. Yet in London, it's considered that the most extreme must be the norm, lest we be accused of being insensitive to Muslims. This is the way the ratchet gets turned. Um, a, an elected member of the Netherlands Parliament, <coughs> a man called Gert Wilders, was recently d arrested and deported at London Airport and sent back to Amsterdam because he'd made a film criticizing the Islamization 
of Holland, which is being a campaign of, of violence, uh, uh, including the murder of Theo van Gogh, the descendant of the great painter who had made a film about the oppression of Muslim women in, in Amsterdam. Um, our Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Rowan Williams, the man who does an almost perfect imitation of a sheep in human form. <laughs> an early objection of mine to Christianity when I was at school was being told that I was a member of a flock. <laughs> I don't know how you chaps and chapesses feel about this. I always felt flock was a bit much, although I know some people of whom it could, could be said. But shepherd, look, we know shepherds don't look after sheep just because they like them, okay? Um, they either want to or fleece them, <laughs> or eat them. Um, the whole thing has always seemed to be a terrible, you'll forgive the expression, I hope, but one has to come out with it. That's how Rowan Williams is to me. And he says that he thinks that the United Kingdom should have Sharia law for Muslims. Oh. No Muslim had demanded this. No Muslim imam had yet felt strong enough to dare demand that there be Sharia law in, in Britain. But the Archbishop of Canterbury says, well, let's make nice. Let's give it to them before they ask for it. Let's cry before we're hurt. Let's concede before it's even been demanded. This is a civilizational question to me, and it must be resisted. And I actually, when I arrived in Atlanta, I turned on the TV, uh, CNN, and the first person I saw was actually Christopher. And I was very alarmed, not at what he was saying, but at what he was speaking against, and that was the notion that there was a serious motion before the United Nations that saying anything critical of Islam would be criminalized. And that's the end of free speech and it's very dangerous. But perhaps you want to comment on that because I think you're probably much more astute the uh, observer UN, of it than the I The United Nations non-binding, <coughs> so far non-binding resolution, which has carried now for three years, and was carried again this week, sponsored by Pakistan, a country for which we pay. It isn't really even a country, barely even a state. It's a construct of Muslim partitionism carved out of the body of India. It wants to tell us what we can say and what we can think in our own country. And it says that we mustn't uh, ever use the word Islam in any sentence that includes the words violation of human rights, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, this is in the week when the government of Pakistan has handed over to the Taliban its most fertile valley, this valley of Swat, 100 miles from the capital of Islamabad. <clears throat> and said, you can run this valley, militarily and legally. You can have Sharia law, and you are the police and the enforcers of it. And you can close all the girls' schools. But we can't say that your religion is anything to do with the violation of human rights. It's preposterous. Your point about the one-way street is very well made, if I may say so. Um, th there are madrasas in, within 50 miles of where I live in Washington, in Virginia. There are Saudi paid for schools that preach violent anti Semitism, a hatred of the Shia Muslims. Remember, don't ever forget, they hate other Muslims too. Uh, of Hindus, of Christians and Crusaders, and of course of atheists. So they've got me, what, three times, I suppose, in this, <laughs> in this uh, field of fire. Um, and don't um, worry, it's coming to a place near you. Um, the Qurans that are given out in our prison system to Muslim prisoners by Muslim chaplains paid for by Saudi Arabia are Qurans written to the Wahhabi tune. They're not just your everyday Quran, they're the Qurans that the Wahhabis want you to read, containing direct incitement. They've been given out with taxpayers' money in the prison system. Militias are forming. Next you'll have militias of this kind with their own chaplains within the United States Armed Forces. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to have Wahhabi preachers in the U.S. Armed Forces? You better get ready for it, unless you're going to take the James Madison view that there shouldn't be any chaplains in the U.S. Armed Forces to begin with or in the prison system. People want to pray, you can't stop them. But we cannot have state-subsidized prayer. We cannot have state-subsidized preachers or chaplains. Give it up or give it to your deadliest enemy and pay for the rope that will choke you. This is very urgent business, ladies and gentlemen, I beseech you. Resist it while you still can, and before the right to complain is taken away from you, which will be the next thing, you will be told you can't complain because you're Islamophobic. The term is already being introduced into the culture as if it was an accusation of race hatred, for example, or, or, or bigotry, whereas it's only the objection to the preachings of a very extreme and absolutist religion. Watch out for these symptoms. They are not just symptoms of surrender, 
very often ecumenically offered to you by men of God in other robes, Christian and Jewish and smarmy ecumenical. These are the, these are the ones who will hold open the gates mm -hmm. for the barbarians. The barbarians never take a city till someone <coughs> holds the gates, the gates open for them. And it's your own preachers who will do it for you and your own multicultural authorities who will do it for you. Resist, resist it while you can. And if you wonder what will happen if you don't, look and see how a cricket team in Middlesex in England had to change its name by force last week because it was called and had been for years the Middlesex Crusaders. Look and see how stories about little pigs can't be taught to children in English schools anymore lest offence be taken by the religion of peace. Resist it while you can. It's funny how the fish rots from the head. I mean, we mentioned the Archbishop of Canterbury <coughs> caving in on Sharia. The Prince of Wales, the chinless, bat-eared <laughs> elder son of Her Majesty the Queen, a man with no taste in women, as far as I can see. Uh, the whole job is waiting for his mother to die. Um, will, on the, when, that, when Her Majesty's heart ceases to beat, will on that, at that instant become head of the state, head of the armed forces, and head of the church. Faiths. This is what you get if you found the National Church on the family values of Henry VIII. But it's not as we did. And he says that he wants to be not just head yeah. of the Church of England, but head of all faiths. Country. And with King Fahd of Saudi Arabia, has built a gigantic Wahhabi Madrasa mosque in North London, where were housed the man in whose honor you have to take off your shoes every time you go to the airport, Richard Reed well-known overnight guests there. There were housed two or th uh, four, I think, of the 9-11 hijackers. Uh, a pest house in the, in the middle of London, paid for by Saudi money, and uh, enjoying the, the patronage of um, His Royal Highness Prince Charles. Uh, uh, it's a trison, a very high-level trison, by, by those whose responsibility it is uh, to safeguard and to uphold what we used to think were the same values. They've sold, they've sold them out in an attempt to show how friendly to Islam they can be. And we are back. Christopher, you talked about the w civil war in Islam. Talk about the role of religion as you see it in the conflict we are now involved with. Well, people attack the president for all kinds of things that he said or appeared to say about religion. But, um, and some of which have been rather ill-considered, including the statement that Islam is a religion of peace, which I would say was a statement that was non-true rather than untrue. Um, the, the Christian churches, almost in their entirety, I believe, were opposed to the regime change in Iraq. And so was the President's own church, the United Methodist Church, for example. It was very interesting to me to find how completely useless Christianity was. In a, in a struggle of this kind. Now, it was awful to find that Christianity was a religion of peace, or at least of pacifism and of surrender. The church, as far as I know, has not endorsed any war as just since it supported General Franco's invasion of Spain to destroy the Spanish Republic with a Muslim mercenary army in the 30s on the side of Hitler. I think this is a wonderful occasion to discuss what the real value of religion in politics and international affairs is. Um, the difficulty for me is that while we are, in a sense, objectively committed to secularism for our own society and in others, if you take, say, just the case of Palestine, American support has, and Israel, American support has up till now gone to a Wahhabi royal family that pumps out anti-Semitic propaganda and anti-American propaganda, but was considered our ally in the Middle East, to uh, Israeli settlements which were run by messianic fanatics who wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for American aid, and to extreme Christians, uh, mainly in the United States, who hope that out of this conflict they can bring on Armageddon and the apocalypse. So, so what, what is otherwise a perfectly soluble problem, division of Palestine between its Arab and Jewish inhabitants, is made impossible by monotheism. No, it's made impossible. Completely poisoned by it. Well, that, 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 that it may be poisoned by the fusion of monotheism with politics. Um, and that's the issue. The issue is not the relevance of faith. The, the issue is the fusion of faith with political power. And this is something that... Well, if you believe that Jesus coming back very soon is going to kill everyone who doesn't agree with him, how do you keep that out of politics? Well, I think you have to the develop... Belief is, the belief is political. I'm sorry, Andrew. No, it's not. Belief can't... <coughs> it is possible. <coughs> and if you believe John Locke, I mean, maybe you don't. But it is possible and should be possible, in fact, essential, given our human experience, 
Christianity is not innocent in this regard. The 16th and 17th centuries were religious wars. People were murdered in large numbers. And out of that experience, that some things you may believe in are still not so important they're worth killing other people for, came liberal democracy. Our very system of government came out of resistance to the power of religion in politics. Absolutely. And what we're fighting for in this war, and I wrote this just at the very beginning of this war, is the possibility of religion outside of politics. And when you read the Gospels, uh, I think that the, the, the overwhelming message is exactly that. My kingdom is not of this world, our Lord said. And, and, and there is a distinction between what Caesar is and what I am. And the idea, I mean, I think that the idea that, that uh, Muslims could create a warrior theology out of Islam is much less amazing than that Christianity might do such a thing. Um, and I also believe that that kind of fundamentalism and zeal in which you think your truth is so important, you should kill another person <laughs> to save his soul, is d as dangerous in this country as it is anywhere else. It's not gotten to the same lengths, but I see the same glint in the eye of someone like Jimmy Swaggart or Pat Robertson and some of the forces that this president is riding to victory on. And I worry. <laughs> I do not want this to become a war between fundamentalist Christianity and fundamentalist Islam. It is a war between fundamentalist religion and liberal democracy. And I say that as a believing Catholic. Well, it's a civil war also within the other monotheisms. And after all, more than half of American Jews and more than half of, of Israeli Jews have always favored a two-state solution that grants self-determination to the Palestinians. They just can't get their way because of this nutcase uh, zealot minority. We, within the religious um, faiths, so also th have There to has fight. to be a civil war within Judaism, it's, uh, if you like. And uh, there is one going on in Islam very clearly, and they're trying to win. The, the fascist side wants to, well, they want to export that war to where we live to try and win it. So they've really involved us in their war. And it, I, it's not my province, Andrew, but uh, the Christian churches can't seem to make up their mind whether we are fighting for our civilization or not, or whether we should feel guilty about existing. Hierarchies. To be continued. Yes. Which will be another hour. Andrew yes, Sullivan, too. Christopher Hitchens, Thanks, come on back. Uh, Jeremy Falwell and Pat Robertson, two guys whose political weight, I think, has for 25 years now been grossly overestimated who never quite do produce the voters and the uh, punch that they claim to have. But let's remember, these are the two men who said that the World Trade Center was the deserved punishment that America had earned for itself, for its so many iniquities. It was they who parroted the line of Pro Professor Chomsky that the United States had this coming. These men prefer any theocracy to any kind of democracy. Of course they are our common enemy, but if I want to go and make war and don't kid about it, I'm perfectly willing to use force with these guys if they even threaten it with us. More than willing. Would rather welcome the chance, actually, to do it. <laughs> I'm going to have a thin time doing it if my allies on the left are making excuses for Islamic Jihad all the while and discrediting their own democracy and isolating themselves within civil society. It, it, the fact of the matter is that you either oppose religious dictatorship and its terrorist surrogates everywhere without distinction, whether it's messianic settlers on the West Bank or Christian nutbags trying to teach us that uh, we trod the earth the same time as the dinosaurs or the forces of jihad. You either oppose this kind of thing, root and branch, or you don't. And I'm sorry to say that the anti-war left has failed the test. It has made excuses for our totalitarian and theocratic enemies. It has said that Mr. bin Laden is the ventriloquist of long forgotten Muslim grievances. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. I'll tell you what the grievances are. The grievance of seeing an undraped female face. The grievance of having a Christian or a Jew or a non-believer living on your soil that you claim is Muslim soil. The horror of having lost the Islamic Caliphate, the empire you want back. These are not anti-imperialists. They're people who want back a lost empire. The people who blew up uh, harmless partygoers in Bali because Australia had helped to liberate East Timor from Indonesian oppression, and East Timor is a Christian population and, and Indonesia is Muslim. High on the list of Bin Laden's grievances, the outrage of our help for East Timor. Yes, they have grievances, yeah, but it's nothing to the grievance we have with them. And it should be we who they are afraid of. It should be our opinion that they are made to care about. We should make it known to them that we too have unalterable values, that yes, we do care about the Enlightenment, and we do care about the defense of our values and institutions under any government, 
Two minutes. Under any government, and that failing to say this is apologetics and possibly worse. And nothing, nothing in what Michael said, it seems to me, would prepare you in any sense for the importance of a struggle of that kind. All right, let's bring Christopher into the discussion now. You don't think this is a hate crime. In, in fact, uh, you went so far to ask the question in your piece, quote, why are we so scared of offending Muslims? Yes, well, the, the two things are very much connected. First, contrast the semi-literate language of the statute you just read out from New York State to the very lucid and beautiful language of the First Amendment to our Constitution, which, which guarantees the right of freedom of expression. That may very well involve, and in fact was designed to protect, uh, criticism of religion. It may be expressed in a very vulgar manner in this case, but if I don't like a book by James Joyce or Karl Marx or Ayn Rand and I decide to spit on it or hurl it around, it's not the sort of thing I'd be likely to do, but it's nobody's business legally. But if you take uh, that same not book, hate crime. It's, if you it's take not a hate crime, it's nothing to, do, nothing to do with and, intimidation. And use it as an act of intimidation. I'll give you an example. Uh, someone sent us What's video of, of a Quran, sent us video of a Quran being shot. That wasn't a hate crime, but that same person took the Quran that was shot and threw it at the door of a Tennessee mosque in an act of intimidation. That's when it crosses the line into a hate crime. It's not, I'm sorry, I'm very sorry, Mr. Tupper. I don't see where that's an act of intimidation. It may, it when may be When you go very to a extreme. house of worship and intimidate them I using suppose desecrated religious texts. I suppose I'll have to just text. wait my turn. All right, but let's, let's uh, uh, Chris, Christopher, bring it back to Pace University. I think the question, I'm sorry. You're I saying thought, there's I'm no sorry, evidence uh, that those Ms. students. Uh, Ms. Zahn. Yeah. Ms. Zahn, I'm sorry, I thought that question was for me. Um, well, I, I, I carry came to on answer about questions the, from the, you, not, not, from Mr., not from Mr. Hooper. The second thing is this, as the, as the uh, leader of an American Muslim uh, lobbying organization which defends, for example, people like the crooner Cat Stevens, who under the name of Yusuf Islam has publicly called for the murder of a novelist now living in New York. He never Mr. did Sohan that, Hushi. and Mr. he Hooper, has Mr. explained Hooper, Mr. that. Mr. Hooper would be Mr. Hooper would be much better, much better employed in attacking what really is intimidating, which is the the awareness among everyone in this profession, including CNN, which told me last year that it wouldn't run the cartoons from Denmark because it was afraid for the safety of its bureau chiefs. Let's see where the real intimidation is coming from. As long as this kind of thing is licensed in the name of religion, Mr. Hooper, you're going to have to expect that people can also be offended. You won't just be the only one to say that you're shocked or upset. Some people will say that they are fed up with religious bullying. And it's high and time by the way, that they did. And Mr. high time you got used to it. Mr. Hooper, don't you acknowledge uh, in the wake of 9-11, there are a lot of Americans who are afraid to cross Muslims. Well, I think uh, we should treat every incident equally. If there was a Bible that was desecrated... But, but you didn't answer the question. What, well, do, are, you do you know, think I Americans, understand. by and large, are afraid to offend Muslims? I, I think people should not offend each other, no matter what the faith they are. Uh, I think we should try and get along and, and not cause as much pro as, uh, problems oh, for exactly. people of other faiths. <laughs> I know, and every day in Iraq, mosques are blown up, not by Christians well, or atheists or Jews. Well, I'm not in Iraq. Every day I'm in Iraq, they're, blo they're, the blown up by, they're blown up by other... They're blown up by other Muslims, and your organization doesn't protest And we've issued countless condemnations it. of those kinds of All acts. right, gentlemen, I, I want you to stand by, because I'm going to bring you back into another part of the discussion. Christopher Hitchens, Ibrahim Hooper, please stay right there. Please. Christopher, uh, fear isn't exactly just, the same just, uh, thing uh, as, it's, as it's hate. Isn't, uh, Christopher, isn't it possible to fear Islam or some aspects of it and, and be free of hate and not be a bigot. Well, phobia means, phobia, I think, as well as meaning uh, fear, does imply uh, dislike. And I, I dislike Islam as I dislike all religion. <laughs> uh, I'm just astounded there by the and turn the discussion has taken. Every, 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 every day, all the time, all the time, we have to hear propaganda pumped out of radio stations across the Muslim world telling uh, children to kill Jews, telling children to kill Hindus. Uh, telling children to kill Christians, telling them that, that their sisters and, and mothers and aunts are inferior, telling them that homosexuals should be stoned. We have to read and claim not to be offended about the stoning of 10 people in the Islamic Republic of Iran in the last 
week alone for crimes that they did not commit. There would, be cri would not be crimes except under the mad religious laws that Islam proposes. Mr. Hooper has to get used to this idea. Some of us find that offensive too, but we don't demand that he be shut down or be prosecuted. We put up with his self-pity. We put up with his rantings and his distortions the because we believe in the First Amendment. The all we ask, like all, all we ask in return, in Abraham, all we ask Abraham, in return is that he the upholds, that had wait, 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 all we demand in return is he, all we demand in return, all we demand in return is he upholds the First Amendment too. We love he the has First Amendment, we uphold it well. every day. And the First Amendment Nonsense. also protects free expression of religion. And when you engage in active, acts of intimidation against a religious group, that goes against the First Amendment. Dennis Prager, you get the last word tonight. You haven't read, you, you have neither read nor understood I'd like the First to ask Amendment, sir. The decline not to say the moral eclipse of the secular left has just been illustrated on this very platform by someone who makes excuses for suicide murder and tries to trace them, and tries to trace them to a second-rate okay, sociology. But to, the, to the, what I think is the hidden agenda of the question, um, is George Bush on a Christian crusade in Iraq and Afghanistan? Obviously not. Obviously not. Anyone who's studied what's happening in either of those countries now knows that the whole of American policy, and by the way, a lot of your own future, ladies and gentlemen, is staked on the hope that federal secular Democrats can emerge from this terrible combat and that we can protect them and offer them help while they do so. We know that they're there, that they, we are, I've met them, I love them, they're our, they're our friends. Um, every member of the 82nd Airborne Division could be a snake handling congregationist for all I know, but these men and women, though you sneer and jeer at them and snigger when you hear applause and excuses for suicide bombers and you have to live with the shame of having done that, these people are guarding you while you sleep whether you know it or not, and they're also creating space for secularism to emerge. And you'd better hope that they are successful. I feel like I should be reading, you know, Kipling's White Man's Burden. <laughs> what you mean is you wish you had read it. <laughs> it's the exact equivalent of the evil nonsense talked by Hedges and friends of his who say the suicide bombers in Palestine are driven to it by despair. Have you read the manifestos of these suicide bombers? Have you seen the videos they make? Have you seen the manifestos they put out, the propaganda that they generate? These are not people of despair. These are people in a state of religious exaltation who are promised everything. who are in a state of hope. who are in a state of, of adoration for their evil mullahs and for their filthy religion. <clears throat> it's this that makes them think that they have the right to kill others while taking their own lives. If despair among Palestinians was enough to create psychopathic criminal behavior, there's been enough despair for a long time, enough misery to go around. It is, it is to excuse the vicious, filthy forces of Islamic Jihad to offer any other explanation but it is their own evil preaching their own vile religion, their own racism, their own apocalyptic ideology that makes them think they have the right to kill everyone in this room and go to paradise as a reward. I won't listen, I, nor should you, to anyone who euphemizes or excuses this evil, wicked thing. Religion consists now, we find, uh, no longer of moral absolutes. We used to be, when I debated with religious types, they would say yes. Um, Circumcision is good, uh, masturbation is bad. We know this, as God tells us so. Hacking of the genitals of a child with a sharp stone is divine. Touching them with a hand, not so great. <laughs> well, we know, so we knew where we were, that we were absolute. Now it's all relative. Now it's all completely relative. It's made up a la carte and cherry picked by mediocre pseudo intellectuals who want you to believe that the following thing that would have happened uh, in the year, in the month of the year that the liberation of Iraq took place, that finally, after endless thesaurus of United Nations resolutions condemning every aspect of its regime, that Iraq was freed from the, from the, from the proprietorship of Saddam Hussein, that was March 2003. You know what would have happened in April 2003? 
Iran was going to be the chair of the United Nations Special Committee on Disarmament. Some people think that would have been a better outcome. More humane, more legal, uh, less troubling, uh, altogether more dealable with, just as um, Iran and Libya have just been re-elected to that very committee on disarmament of the United Nations. I ask you, you pick that kind of relativism, you'll also find you're dealing with a very surreptitious form of absolutism, which is only capable of describing as fascistic, relatively comical forces who I've denounced up and down the hill all my life in the United States, who cannot use the word totalitarianism about the religion that actually conducts jihad, actually organizes totalitarianism, actually inflicts misery, pain, unemployment, and despair upon millions of people, and then claims what it has done as the license for suicide and murder. A perfect picture has been given to you of the, of the cretinous relationship between sloppy moral relativism, half big news absolutism, and the journalism that lies in between. Thank you. If there was no other question involved in the episodes we've been discussing, it would still seem to me in, of the first importance to realize that the, the real battle is between secularism and religious fanaticism of all kinds. And that this is a, an enormously important front in that battle. And that if there's one thing that is left of the culture of the left, the contribution of the left, history, it must be that of the Enlightenment and the spread of Enlightenment ideas. One cannot be neutral about these things. And we can't take them for granted either, the gains we have owed to the Enlightenment, and that they need to be defended. And that they're being attacked at their very foundation by jihadists and by supporters of caliphate. I can't, I have, I've tried, I've, I've argued this with every, uh, almost every leading member of the anti-war movement, so-called, and I've never been able to see how a leftist can take any but one position on this, or, or a liberal. That's first and most important. After that, there may be a lot to quarrel about, but to recognize that it is an enemy and it must be defeated should not be controversial, and yet, I can't get people to agree even to that first principle. And this strikes me as very dangerous. There's, there's, there's something of a death wish involved here, I think. So I sometimes fear. People, in, in, a, in a way, are tired, are bored of their society, and of their life. They don't think it's worth fighting for. They, in a way, they find the idea of contemplating its destruction in a, in a boring way, an alienated, anomic way, enjoyable. They secretly want it to happen. It's a very dangerous symptom, I think. Uh, Mr. Hitchens. Um, Sir. <laughs> that was a curious interruption there. I'm not sure what that was. Um, I address you as a, an atheist uh, and, 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 a, and a secularist and a Marxist. Um, I'm very much troubled by, by your remarks about the need to stand up and, and, and fight this, this Muslim jihad. I have no time for, uh, for oppressive religion of, 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 of any stripe, but I, I think uh, you are well aware of the long history of crimes committed by the British government in Iraq, the United States government uh, in Vietnam and today in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm wondering how you can possibly say that it is Western civilization, the civilization of the colonizers and the oppressors, who do it all, of course, in the name of liberation and democracy, uh, how, how this is not the fundamental problem, ra rather than what you call the jihad of what I consider to be the response to the, the crimes of, uh, of U.S. and uh, European imperialism. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There you have it. You see how 
You see how far the termites have spread and how long and well they've dined. When someone can get up and say that in a meeting of unbelievers, that the problem is Western civilization, not the Islamic threat to it. That's how far the termites have got. Now, as a matter of fact, sir, I could have asked that question 50 times better than you did and answered it 50 times as comprehensively. If you'd like, I can, without conceit, refer you to a biography of mine by, of Henry Kissinger that is a compendium and anthology of the war crimes committed uh, by the United States and its allies in the Third World and elsewhere, and a call for those people, those responsible, to be arraigned for crimes against humanity and war crimes. It's a cheap paperback published by the New Left Review that anyone can get hold of, and I can't recommend too highly. One of those crimes, I'll just give you an example to show how utterly fatuous your implication is. One of those crimes was the uh, arming and training of the Indonesian armed forces to take over the Republic of East Timor. Some of you are no doubt aware of this terrible atrocity. Leading, it's one of Noam Chomsky's best campaigns in writing, um, leading to the very near physical extirpation of the people of East Timor. Uh, a genocide more comprehensive than, than Cambodia, taking place a little afterwards with our weapons, with our diplomatic protection, and with the endorsement of Kissinger and Ford. Hands up those who roughly remember this. Okay, not as good as I'd have liked, but still, and sad, but, uh, but bear it in mind and look it up. Now, what are, what are some of the items of the Al-Qaeda bin Laden manifesto? Well, oddly enough, and this was to my surprise, I thought it would be lower down, Item three in the charge against the West is that it reversed course on East Timor, tried to undo the genocide, uh, brought East Timor to a referendum on independence, sent Jose uh, Vera de Mielo, one of the greatest, um, uh, sorry, Sergio Vera de Mielo, one of the greatest UN civil servants, to East Timor to supervise the transition to independence and the election, and made East Timor the newest member of the UN. Bin Laden says, for this we will never forgive the Christian crusaders and their imperialist friends. They took away a republic from a Muslim land, Indonesia. Most of the people of East Timor, by the way, are, are Christian and speak Portuguese. Um, a detail. Uh, for this, we will never forgive them. For this, they, that was the reason they gave for blowing up the UN office in Iraq, because that's where Melia was sent next. With a truck bomb of explosives so enormous that it must have been borrowed from the former Iraqi army and Ba'ath Party. That's the reason they gave for blowing up the Australian tourists in Bali, in Indonesia, and the um, Indonesian taxi drivers who were servicing that resort, because they couldn't forgive the West for its behavior in East Timor. In other words, if you want to avoid upsetting these people, you have to let Indonesia commit genocide in East Timor. Otherwise, they'll be upset with you. You'll have made an enemy. If you tell them they can't throw acid in the faces of unveiled women in Karachi, they will be annoyed with you. If you say, we insist, we, uh, we think that c cartoonists in Copenhagen can print satire on the Prophet Muhammad, you've just made an enemy. You've brought it on. You're, you're, you're encouraging it to happen. So unless you're willing to commit suicide for yourself and for this culture, Get used to the compromises you'll have to make and the eventual capitulation that will come to you. But bloody well don't do that in my name because I'm not doing it. You surrender in your own name, leave me out of it. I'm going to fight these people and every other theocrat all the way. All the way. For free expression, for free expression, for women's rights, for self-determination of small peoples, for the right of Iraqis to federate and have their own show, for the right of the Lebanese not to be bullied by Hezbollah and to have a multicultural democracy. Yes, I'll fight for this, and I think that the 82nd Airborne is brave to be fighting for it too. And I think you should be ashamed sneering at people who guard you while you sleep. Thanks. Well. Oh, yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, you suggest that we, we should fight Islam. We should try and limit fundamentalist Islam. That's a serious problem that we have to take. You know, that Actually, we that's not what fight. I say. Huh? That's not what I say. Oh, I, must I say we are that. fighting it. Oh, okay. That's, well, it we is are fighting us. But uh, so my question is, is how exactly does uh, bombing and killing Muslims lessen their numbers or limit their fervor?
Um, I'm just wondering if I should draw you a picture. You mean, how does killing them lessen their number? <laughs> Your question cannot possibly be as sappy as it sounds. You must have meant something more intelligent than that. Well, my idea is, you, you must have come across this. The numbers of those bombed will decline. Oh, um, <laughs> oh yes, but that encourages others. Well, ah, you're so sure? Yes. Yes, well, I remember being told after 9-11, if we destroy Osama bin Laden, hundreds will spring up in his place. Some of you may have said that. Hope not. You all heard it. Well, in that case, we would find a quick way of surrendering, hadn't we? Had we better not? I mean, there's no point in resisting in that case, because by the more we, the more we beat them, the more strong they'll get. It's like the Greek myth of Antaeus. Every time thrown to the ground, he drew strength from the soil. Unbeatable. If you think, if you think that, by all means, think it. But I don't know what you're doing at a conference that wants to defend atheism against uh, religious barbarism. How do I envision victory, someone asks from the floor. Um, I'll tell you, how, I'll tell you what, how, how I'd know it was possible. It would come like this. When the side of jihad said, can we take these casualties any longer? When they worried, have we alienated the people as they are worrying now in Iraq? Have we turned everyone off by our tactics? Have we lost friends? Has our reputation gone down? When they ask this, when they say, have we disgraced and discredited ourselves by rape and by video torture and by the killing of uh, other Muslims, they're the ones who are killing Muslims. They're the ones who are blowing up the mosques, not me, not us. They do it and boast of it for, for, the, uh, for the mutilation of women, for the throwing of acid in the faces of girls, for the, for the car bombing of girls' schools. I wonder if we've made a mistake by doing this. That's what I want to hear them say. And also, can we take it any longer? The Marines come for us by day or night. They shoot us like rats. We bring in volunteers. None of them ever come back. None of them ever go home. They're all killed in Iraq. It's a killing field for us. We, we shove people by the hundreds over the border in open order from a Pakistan into Afghanistan. They're all killed. When do we have to ask ourselves, is God really on our side? That's the point we have to get to. Instead, the sickly, petty masochism of American public opinion saying, shouldn't we haul the flag to half-staff every time one of us gets killed? Shouldn't we be the ones in doubt that we're fighting a just war? Shouldn't we be the ones who are worrying that we have a right on our side? No, no, no. Enough of that. Make them worry. We can get to that point because they are, don't forget, they are suicidal. They are irrational. They operate on a crazy worldview. They will get to the stage where they've realized they've made a mistake. All the evidence is in Iraq already that al-Qaeda in Iraq has totally isolated and discredited itself, and it's a matter now just of hunting down and killing them, which I think is a pleasure as well as a duty. Can we do two more questions? Yeah, Christopher, let me, let me ask you, this, in, in, all, in all seriousness, this is a profoundly post-9-11 book. Yes. You wrote this book, I think, because of what occurred on 9-11 and because of the struggle that we now confront uh, with uh, fundamentalist jihadist Islam, or if you've called it Islamofascism. Yes. Okay. Does it, is it possible that in making the argument there and in trying and in, and in you know, giving that argument as much breadth as possible, you've overlooked the virtues of religious pluralism in a country that enforces, albeit imperfectly and at, with continual struggle, separation of church and state? It's as if this book, for all of your admiration of Jefferson, sometimes behaves as if that wall did not exist here, that it had never been made to work anywhere. Is it is all conceivable? The, there is a problem with having, having said as I did, that religious pluralism is a, is a great thing in itself hmm. uh, and, is, and can only be guaranteed by a secular state. The, th right. the point the religious Absolutely. just keep on not getting. You see. Yeah. If only the state was all Baptist, we'd be fine. <laughs> um, they want to teach creation in school. They say, all right, I'll teach you the Hindu creation myth to your children. And now are you happy? Say, no, I'm sure not. I say, well, you asked for it. You know, now you've got it. And, um, there is a problem of that kind, which is um, reverse ecumenicism. 
Well, mm. I'll tell you what I mean by that, apparently arcane statement. I'm sure everyone here remembers the uh, assault on the tiny European democracy of Denmark last year. Mm. Why was the Danish economy subjected to a campaign of international sabotage backed by not just movements but states? Why were its embassies burned down in countries where demonstrations are not normally allowed? Why was all this? Because its prime minister could not be forced or persuaded to um, censor cartoons in the afternoon press in Copenhagen because it's against Danish law for him to do this. Right? So, you and I are members of this great profession. Mm -hmm. Did the Los Angeles Times publish those cartoons? No, it didn't. But I wrote, I wrote a column in the Los Angeles Times that began, the editor of the Los Angeles Times will not allow you to see these cartoons. Voila. And went on to argue that it was a great breach of faith with the people of Denmark and with Danish democracy. And that column appeared as one of two I did about this and about the, the cowardly surrender. It was one of, of about five that did, and I remember them. I remember it vividly because you, you and I were in such a small minority. Mm -hmm. In a media totally dominated now by image, totally dominated by images, yeah. it was not considered uh, appropriate to tell the American public, here's a story it's all about the fight over some pictures. We're mm. not going to show you what the pictures are. Listen, as a, as a, religi as a religious believer right, myself, I'm totally no, unaffected but, but wait, by no, these no, things. No, wait, 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 it's because yeah. it's not you I'm trying to persuade. Yeah. I'm just right. making a point. The um, image-dominated press said, no, we're not going to show you. Neither out of solidarity with our Danish colleagues, which would be a good point, or just to show you what the fuss is about. No, they wouldn't. <laughs> That's either out of fear of the religious, or it's out of fear of offending them, which comes to more or less the same thing. It's blackmail. In the United States of America, in 2006, there wasn't a single member of our profession in a position to make a decision who would stand up for one day to outright blackmail. And people say to me, why do you keep mentioning the extremists? I said, because the extremists are the tail that wag the whole dog. And my profession proves it, and your culture proves it, and you were humiliated by this. And it gets worse, because I write for a very small atheist magazine called Free Inquiry, and I'm published out of Amherst, Massachusetts, which did publish the cartoons. See, so it's a responsibility. First, solidarity with the Danes. Second, people should see what the fuss is about. Hmm. Borders, books, takes our magazine off the rack. So we, you can't sell your magazine now. I've refused to read or speak in a Borders bookstore ever since. The least I could do. Unless they really, really, really offer me a lot of money. In <laughs> a complete capitulation, a total capitulation. And people say, why do I focus on the extremists? Because the extremists have the initiative and because, I haven't started yet, who condemned what? I remind you, individual Scandinavians were murdered in Af everywhere from Afghanistan to Nigeria by this hysterical prearranged campaign. 21 ambassadors from Muslim, so-called Muslim states. How dare they call themselves Muslim? In what sense is Egypt a Muslim country? You can't denominate a country as religious. Waited upon His Holiness the Pope. Well, and in, fact, and in fact, two leading Egyptian newspapers, as I pointed out in my column, did run the cartoons. They're braver than the American papers. But His Holiness the Pope condemned what? The cartoons. Mm. The State Department condemned the cartoons, not the violence, not the campaign of intimidation. His, the Archbishop of Canterbury condemned the cartoons. Every church I know of condemned the blasphemy of the cartoons, not the campaign of murder and sabotage and intimidation. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the barbarians are not at the gate. They're not at the gate. They're well inside. And who held open the door for them? The other religious did. It was the same with Salman Rushdie. When, the, when the, the Ayatollah Khomeini offered money, money, publicly, in his own name, without shame, for suborning of murder of a novelist who wasn't an Iranian, who lived in England. A pretty radical attack on what we think we live by, and what our constitution stands for, what Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Payne thought it was worth fighting for. The Cardinal Archbishop of New York, the Chief Rabbi of Israel, his Holiness the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, all condemned what? The novel, the author, for blasphemy. 
Now, get used to this, because you may be living in the last few years where you can complain about it. Because the religious really mean this, you know. They are not just joking. They really mean to abolish everything you care about, and they want to take away everything you love, and to destroy everything you have, and to replace it with a Stone Age ideology derived from the desert of Palestine in a very bad time in human history. Now, and just because they were there first, they think they own everything, they think they have the right to tell you what you can think, who you can sleep with, what you can eat, what you can read, and they claim the right to make you afraid even to read in the United States of America this year. So I don't want to hear from anybody that my book says, well, don't judge religion by its extremes, okay? Don't do that. There is a major effort taking, uh, taking uh, place to curb free speech in this country, irrespective of our Constitution, our Bill of Rights. And free speech advocates say the United Nations has come down on precisely the wrong side. The United Nations has adopted what it calls a resolution combating defamation of religions. The United Nations now wants to make that anti-blasphemy resolution binding on member nations, including, of course, our own. That would make it a crime in the United States if the United Nations were to have its way to criticize religion, in particular, Islam. Kelly Pilgrim has our report. The UN General Assembly is considering a binding resolution urging member states to make it a crime to criticize Islam. What they would do would be to make it illegal to uh, put out a movie uh, or a, write a book or a poem which somebody could say was defamatory of uh, Islam. The so-called anti-blasphemy resolution would call on governments to pass their own laws to determine what can be said about religion in public. The resolution urges states to provide within their respective legal and constitutional systems adequate protection against acts of hatred, discrimination, intimidation and coercion resulting from defamation of religion. But the U.S. says the concept of defamation of religion has another meaning. While appearing in name to promote tolerance, the implementation of this concept actually fosters intolerance and has served to justify restrictions on human rights and fundamental freedoms. Even talking about the influence of Islam on terrorism could be called criminal under this resolution if adopted by an individual country. You are entitled to say that in America but not if the UN has its way. They would criminalize that kind of practice and they are trying to do it elsewhere around the world. A group of 57 organization of Islamic countries, the largest bloc at the United Nations, has been pushing it out of concern, it says, over anti-Islamic behavior, saying, this resolution is a major step towards sensitizing the international community on the serious impact of defamation of religions. Last December, the General Assembly passed it as a non-binding resolution. And this year, a binding resolution is expected to be introduced as early as March. Human rights activists say its influence is already being felt. There have been a number of prominent cases most recently in India, uh, for instance, the editor of a newspaper um, was charged um, for reprinting um, an article that had initially been printed in the UK. While the article mentioned the three major religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, the editor was arrested for, quote, hurting the religious feelings of Muslims. Now, essentially what this resolution would do is to urge countries to pass laws in their country, which would be unconstitutional in the United States, and basically violate the spirit of many Western judicial systems, Lou. Yeah, I, I, a couple of questions. One is, of those 57 nations uh, supporting this uh, uh, resolution, how many of them are democracies? Uh, I couldn't tell you, but many of them are Islamic countries. Uh, Pakistan has led the, uh, the charge on this and has, uh, has tabled this so resolution. They're, so they're times. not democracies, and they, uh, they're fascinated with their own uh, uh, precepts about uh, what would constitute uh, the way to run a nation not like ours. 
Uh, is there any any discussion of perhaps of simply uh, if the United Nations insists on doing this, sort of bulldozing the building, getting it out of the way, and letting them go find another place to live? It wasn't really discussed in my uh, perhaps, my discussions today. <laughs> well, perhaps we can raise that as an alternative to impinging on our our, uh, our constitutional uh, liberties. Uh, Kitty Pilgrim, thank you very much. Appreciate it from the United Nations. What a place. Well, joining me now with more on the U.N. effort to stifle free speech, uh, to squelch it, really, is Christopher Hitchens. He's Vanity Fair economist, author of God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Christopher, I, I, I have to say, first, welcome. Great to have you back with us. Secondly, how dare these people uh, attempt such a thing? Well, first, thank you for having me back. And second, look, the claim of Islam is that it is the last and final revelation from God to humanity. That's quite a big claim to make, that you don't need another book after the Quran. Uh, you don't need any more evidence. You don't need any more argument. It's all done for you. Now, that's okay if people want to claim that. But now they want to say, if you have any difficulty with this mm -hmm. uh, idea, if you have any doubts about it, you're not allowed to express them. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you do, you are insulting us. Uh, you're making us feel hurt. Now, just imagine the, those two claims put together. One, a fantastic claim, and the other, a fantastic claim that you can't challenge. That is totalitarianism defined. It's a rape uh, and butchery of the First Amendment of our Constitution. Uh, it, it's it, also being joined, though, Christopher, by a lot of nations that are not Islamic, uh, and there seems to be a, a, a strong uh, a move forward, and it's already, in, in point of fact, been approved at this level by the United Nations. I have to say that we, got, we are reaching a point in the United States where we've got a group of people who will go around clucking, saying, oh, yes, this will be just fine, uh, irrespective of our constitutional rights. Because there's some, you know, there, uh, we have Americans now. There is a, a movement afoot in this country for hidebound orthodoxy of all sorts of uh, extremes, uh, politically, uh, religiously, in which people say, you know, the heck with the Constitution. Uh, there are higher uh, issues at No, no, you're, you're, you're quite right about that. I mean, when... Um when Salman Rushdie was uh, sentenced to death by a senile uh, theocrat in Iran uh, for writing a novel, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, His Holiness the Pope, um, certainly the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel and many other religious figures joined with Khomeini, not in exactly endorsing the fatwa, right. uh, the death sentence, but in saying the problem was blasphemy, uh, that they agreed with the Ayatollah to that extent. The problem was not the, the destruction of free speech and free expression, but, but um, the hurt feelings of the religious. This is a common uh, problem. In, in, in Britain, there's a blasphemy law that only protects Christians. For example, it's a big source of Muslim grievance. But when you clear away all these discrepancies, there's one overwhelming thing that's happening, um, and it's this. There are, there are Muslims who are prepared to use violence at the drop of a hat if a cartoon is published in Denmark if the Pope makes an off-the-cuff remark, a stupid one in my opinion, about Byzantium uh, or the Crusades, th they go straight to violence, but yet you cannot criticize them for being violent lest you be accused of blasphemy. Yeah, and it is, it is well, Islam, of course, uh, Christianity, whatever it may be, uh, I, the United Nations is getting a bit burdensome, it seems to me, to anyone who's interested in freedom. Uh, whether it be through the World Trade Organization, whether it be all sorts of institutions, organizations ranging an issue from global warming to uh, anti-blasphemy. Yes. Uh, this is becoming a totalitarian, authoritarian uh, organization. And political yes, which, correctness it, it, is really do, an effort to, to control, yeah. uh, more, seemingly to me at least, uh, nothing more than an effort to control thought nothing to do with its remit either, which is the settlement of disputes among member states by peaceful means. Of course, nothing to do with that at all. Um, and remember, uh, thanks to Eleanor Roosevelt, all member states or applicants for membership of the UN were not compelled, but were strongly urged to sign the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, right. which, among other things, protects freedom of expression. And, it's and the, the countries that refused could still join, but remember that they were the then Soviet Union uh, and Saudi Arabia. Those were the countries that said we, we would rather not have to think of universal human rights. Universal forced. human rights exist 
whether religion uh, recognizes them or not. And we have to stand up for this. Yeah. And we have to better start standing up for it now, I would say, against theocracy. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, uh, you know, in the course of the last several days, uh, to my knowledge, I've been the only one in the national, uh, I will put it this way, electronic media, uh, that has uh, challenged uh, Reverend Al Sharpton on the issue of the First Amendment, seeking the firing uh, and the actually the intervention uh, of the federal government on the New York uh, Post because of a, a cartoon that was lame, as I've said, insensitive, and, 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 and I thought a uh, demonstration of bad judgment, but not racist. Where in the world has the national liberal media been on that issue? It was a very crummy cartoon, I, I have to say. Absolutely. But, but um, I, I can't imagine what they were doing. It, it, it wasn't, it, it, another crime, by the way, it wasn't funny. I mean, can we just say that that's also an offense? Oh, I started out with lame. Extreme, yeah. Um, un, being unfunny is a fantastic failure in a cartoonist. <laughs> and but I think we should, not we the should job. have people's it's heads well for every time the, they don't perform. The federal, the federal government has no competence in these matters. Right. And it can't be solicited for this. Now, just stroll back a bit. I've been to Friday prayers in Tehran. Right. Several times. Christopher, the, I'm going to have the, to leave you at prayer. Organized, you organized, ch we're organized out of chanting, time. organized chanting of death to America, right. death to Britain, death to Israel. The, its its head of state is allowed to come to the UN. That's fine by me. But don't let them tell me that yeah. only those who criticize them are yeah. are being blasphemous. Yep. I, I, I well, I have to say that I, my my patience is ending primarily with the United Nations. That's arrogant enough to think it uh, should uh, uh, leave us subservient to its. Uh, collective will. Christopher Hitchens, always good to have you here. Wish we had nice more time. Thank you. Okay. Well, we want to know what you think. Our poll question tonight is, do you believe the United Nations restriction of freedom of speech in the United States should be tolerated? Yes or no? Cast your vote at bluedoms.com. We'll have the results here later. Ninety-eight percent of you say the United Nations restriction of freedom of speech in the United States should not be tolerated. Uh, and I'm thinking about bulldozers, but that's an addendum. Let's start talking about radical Islam. Uh, joining me are Bernard Henri Levy, who wrote, uh, among several great works, Who Killed Daniel Pearl? Azra Nomani is the author of Standing Alone, An American Woman's Struggle for the Soul of Islam. Uh, Fawaz Gergis' most recent book is Journey of the Jihadist, Inside Muslim Militancy. And Christopher Hitchens wrote, God is Not Great, how Religion Poisons Everything, among many, many other books. Bernard, the problem of radical Islam presents itself very dramatically in the last two weeks in Pakistan. The Pakistani government has signed this deal uh, in Sawat with the Taliban. Is this a capitulation to the forces of, uh, of Islamism, or is it a kind of recognition of reality and perhaps the hope for some political stability? The real distinction to make, the real one, is between religion and politics. As for myself, I, am, I have nothing against a religious faith, nothing against a, a Muslim, even fundamentalist, as long as his faith remains between himself and himself, even a fundamentalist. I can agree, I can speak with a fundamentalist reader of the Koran, but when it comes to say that Koran should be the rule to create a society, when it comes to say that the treatment of women, of, uh, of foreigners, and the rule of a, of a country depends on Koran, then it is a political question, okay. and then we have, then we yes. have to defend but, the civilian society against, against that. Taliban Maybe or Al-Qaeda is I the same. It is a political movement which must be qualified as fascist, and the question is to know if democracies have to oppose fascism or not. If we think that we don't have to oppose fascism, it's a point of view, may, may it's I, not absolutely. mine. Let, let, me, let me, the question, the first question is, what are the differences between the Taliban on the one hand and the global jihadists on the other? This I, is, and that, that's the yeah. first, and the second question, what do we want? What do we do, we as the Western world? That mm -hmm. is, what's our goal? Promote, the first, promote the, defend democracy? That, that's, the first question is, uh, Farid, Al-Qaeda is waging a global jihad, all-out war against the United States and its allies, be it close Western powers in Eastern states. The Taliban, regardless, we'll come back to what I'll, the Taliban is not interested in waging a global jihad along the same lines as the, the global jihadist al-Qaeda. Point one, the Taliban have been on record saying their goal, regardless, I agree, I fully agree, mm -hmm. the Taliban 
is a bloody, regressive, I'm not going to go into the fascist, fascist state, or not. historical fascist. analogies, reactionary, or not. Re regressive, uh, I mean, uh, 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 whatever. But the Taliban is not interested in waging global jihad. This particular Afghanistan and Pakistan must be one, was, must be won by Pakistani, by Pakistani and Afghani progressive. Right. Where's our help? What could we do instead of waging no. war? Because our warfare, as you suggested earlier, has played directly into the hands right. of the so Taliban. Let me ask, sure, let me, let me ask you a question. Yes. There isn't a single member of the Taliban who has been found involved in any global terrorist Never. Act, no. right? So, so why are we at war with them? Not why should we oppose them? There's a why are we at war well, with them? Well, I just wanted to say to Fawaz that I have a different memory the, than his, or from, my memory differs from his, I should say, um, about the relationship, symbiotic, I would call it, between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. It, it could be that this vote on the Shura Council did take place, but when the Taliban were offered by President Bush, you, we will leave you alone if you give up your horrible and his henchmen, they refused. They said, we'd rather uh, fight you. Mullah Omar, again, Mullah Omar. I, I, but that's, that's, that's the document. The yes, yes, yes. But, but, a man, a man, who, a man who, we no the Afghan. a man who we missed the chance to kill, yeah, but, and who's now going around blinding and, true, and burning true, uh, We're women. not disagreeing. But, uh, but there isn't a single Afghan who has been involved in a terrorist attack. Uh, against the United States, Britain, France, and, you know, anything outside of the Af yeah, Afghan. And I yeah. submit but to you, they, 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 just, they, they, simply, provi and, they and, simply provided the, the, the hinterland for Al-Qaeda. I mean, they, they, they meant that Al-Qaeda had a state at yes. its disposal. I mean, and, we and can't, we, I think we have the right to say we will make the life of any government that shelters these people unlivable, unbearable. And it doesn't matter if it makes us unpopular. Uh, we just, we raise that cost mm -hmm. to the point where no, no rogue or failed or potentially rogue or fail state can take it. And, have, and I want to add right, that there is right not only attacks on America, there is also attacks on little girls, on women, on the Democrats in Afghanistan itself. Yes. On India. Taliban I mean, commit every day attacks, attacks against so civilians so in their country. Lashkar e Toiba, Lashkar e Jangvi, Jaish e Mohammed, these groups which were responsible, for example, on the attack of Bombay. Are they Al-Qaeda or are they Taliban? They are both of them. There is an indistinct frontier. There is a space between the two. You isn't cannot this separate. Like, isn't this uh, uh, Bernard, Bernard like saying, you know, all these communists and socialists were the same during the Cold War? Wasn't it important to actually make distinctions who, who is the between, the, between, between Stalin and Tito, between Stalin and Mao? Fa Farid, between, when you have, the, cu when you have the cult of blood, when you have the cult of violence, Stalin and when, you have, the cult when, of when you hate the women, when you hate the Jews, and when you hate the democratic the, values, yeah, that's uh, not, uh, but, but Bernard, but one is trying to kill may, may us I, and one, the other may The not. difference between the two is global. The word global so, makes the difference. I mean that Taliban's as themselves probably will not have committed the September 11 bloodbath, sure. But or any other, or any, or other, any other, other foreign attack. Attack. the yeah. difference is global. But should we be concerned only not when absolutely. an anti-democratic movement Sorry. becomes global? Man, no, that's man, not my, my question to you. Is should we go to war? Absolutely. Should we drop bombs on people who are doing despicable things to women in Afghanistan? Is that a cause to go to war with? And, and also the, the question. The question is: Could it be? Could it be just for a second that our war in Afghanistan and Pakistan producing the opposite results? from the intended consequences. This is, we have to discuss this, uh, point sure. one. Right. Point so, two, and, and point military, two. And military, military strategy yeah. may not be the solution, but there's an undoubtedly a conflict that we have to resolve. I mean, this is something that the Obama administration must tackle differently than we had in, uh, solutions in the Bush administration. It may just be a matter of time before the Afghanistan Taliban extend their reach. I mean, the truth is that they have been enmeshed with each other. The jihadi groups in Pakistan have been working closely with the Taliban group groups and Al-Qaeda has been immersed in that. The Danny Pearl case is a perfect example of how jihadi groups in Pakistan perhaps intersected with some of these larger elements with global dreams. And so I think it's, in, it's, yes, uh, it's of completely short-sighted. For us, it's a very central question. I would post this. I mean, it's, it, it was said in Iraq uh, until very recently that the harder we fight in Iraq, the more we bring jihadists into the country, the more it becomes their place, the more we create the equal and opposite uh, f effect to the one we hope to create. Nonsense. Nonsense. But the biggest... Christopher, to be fair, the, bigger, the, the, battlefield yeah. defeat the most important thing we did in Iraq 
was we started talking Absolute to the jihadists the who had been killing us. Faith. We made a distinction in Iraq between Absolutely. The Sunni, Sunni jihadists and the Al-Qaeda. Al on the one hand saying these guys are nasty, they're bad, but they, and, they, and they were actually killing us, but we said, but they are not inherently in, that, in their nature, uh, you know, about global jihad. And that's how that's the world was We can around. separate them. No, look, I'm, I'm isn't not, that, I'm isn't not that very much... I'm splitting these groups or, or trying to turn them at all. I'm saying that I don't want, to, I don't want the distinction between them to be uh, made too absolute. And I, do, and I don't like the argument that the counterstroke is our fault. It was just bad generalship. I mean, we worked out ways of inflicting not just a battlefield defeat on al-Qaeda, in Iraq, but a political defeat as well. They've, they've been humiliated and discredited in front of, so to say, but their mainly own because Absolutely. because we, brought, we 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 took the Sunni community, 90 percent, as as Patrice's advisor no. Kilcullen says, we talked to 90 percent of the jihadists and isolated 10 percent. Two empirical points. And can I add to, can, five, right, can, right, can I can I add two empirical points? The war in Iraq, Christopher, has been turned around as a result of we making distinctions between the Sunni-based insurgency and the global jihadists. This is, we have not won the war against Al-Qaeda in Iraq. The Sunni community has chased Al-Qaeda out of Iraq. All right, we've got to take a break. We will be right back. My concern is over um, the right to criticize religion uh, and uh, uh, not to, not to, uh, uh, well, uh, for example, um, we have, we have this, uh, a resurrection of the whole Danish cartoon debate uh, and protest that's going on after, uh, what was it, uh, uh, intelligence indicated that these cartoons, um, that uh, there was a death, there was an assassination plot on the, one of these cartoons, and so they republished them. These debates are brewing up. And I often see hostility towards um, the people who are Making, writing the cartoons and publishing in solidarity. Yeah, well, I can help you out there. Um, Fleming Rose, who, the editor of the, the Joplin Post, is a, who commissioned and published those cartoons and gave his reasons why he thought it was time to do it, is a friend of mine and is one of the many friends I now have. Um, not all of them Europeans, some of them, um, who have to live under police protection now. Uh, and, and not because of any imagined terrorist threat, I might add, but, or any uh, hyped or fabricated one, because of a very, very direct one, a threat of violence to their own persons and the, and the magazines and other outlets of information and opinion that, um, that they work for and with. Uh, and I was the one who organized the demonstration in front of the Danish embassy in Washington, thinking it was about time the Danes saw at least a friendly crowd outside one of their embassies, just one day, made up of, of people who were not mainly motivated by hatred and violence. Uh, that's presumably why I'd have to tell you about the demonstration. It didn't get any coverage because it didn't threaten violence or practice hatred. Um, the the uh, entire American media, with the exception of the Weekly Standard and a magazine I write for myself occasionally, um, well actually regularly, um, Free Inquiry, uh, refused to publish as a news item the pictures that were in contention. In other words, people were told there's a fight about some images. In the age of the image, the completely image-dominated period of media existence, the images themselves were not deemed to be fit for showing. Now, come on, everybody knows what's going on here. And self-censorship is probably the very least of it. Anyway, or it would be if there wasn't actual censorship, or in other words, if the copies of our little magazine had not been pulled from the shelves of Borders Book. Borders Book says, you reprint those statues? We are not going to let you sell them last year. So I will never do another reading in Borders Book. It's a small thing, Department of Empty Threats, just I won't. Okay? And they, they know why. Um, but, the, but to tell you this is in a sense to tell you some news, because I, I can't tell you the people who gave in because of threats, because telling you that would be telling you things that could be of use to those who are bringing the threats of physical force. So it's a very, it's a very neatly wrapped up capitulation of a whole culture crying before it's hurt when there actually is no threat that we could not with ordinary pugnacity just resist and say we won't be spoken to in this tone of voice. Surrenders prearranged and done in advance without anyone being consulted. No reader, no voter has been even asked what, what they think about whether they would whether they would themselves accept a microscopic risk to defend the First Amendment and the values that underpin it. This I think is a really a really gruesome state of affairs. 
how does um, because people would argue that these images uh, because they are intolerant and because they are bigoted uh, uh, that's why so that's not what they argue publish. they don't argue that at all never heard that argue the, uh, the, it, was, it was made very plain to me I know, I live in Washington, it's my hometown, Washington, D.C., nation's country. I know a lot of the people who are responsible for making these editorial decisions in newspapers, magazines, and television stations. And I know why they made it. It was out of fear. Simple. They didn't say, we don't want to say something intolerant about Islam. This is, we can't stand the heat that we think might result. So they're anticipating. It's known in playground terms as crying before you've been hurt. So in your view, this isn't misguided. It is nothing. No, no. It is. It, it is. It is bodyguarded by a soggy multiculturalism. So that the only kind of of uh, of, of um, any any variety, any diversity, is uh, to be defended, except the one that insists upon diversity. In other words, it redefines diversity as uniformity. If I say. First Amendment and its rights include the right to be offensive to uh, religious fanatics. So, ah, you're just the one group you're, it isn't quite covered by our wonderful, gorgeous mosaic of diversity and tolerance. I see. I understand. I get it completely. Why then? That's fine. Just don't call it diversity anymore. Call it uniformity and live with it. I think I have the right to insist on that. The fear is not completely baseless, though. Because damn straight it's not baseless. I know people who really do have to live under. Yeah, well, and, but, but most of us remember Theo van Gogh, who was um, murdered in an Amsterdam street. Actually, ritually, ritually murdered, disemboweled, subjected to a, yeah. a ritualized religious killing as of a sheep or an animal. Um, and his his uh, collaborator, Ayan Hersi Ali, who's a very close friend of mine. Um, now has to live under complete protection. So does Fleming Rose, the editor of the Jutland Post. So, uh, so for a very long time did my friend Salman Rushdie uh, for the crime of writing a novel. Um, no, there's no question that this is a serious threat. But then where is the intolerance coming from? When those who say that the intolerance comes from those of us who resist and satirize this uh, are preparing in full view, not a murder, but a suicide. So, so um, other than fear in the Islamic uh, case, when we look at this as a broader phenomena, um, what do you think accounts for the double standard in which how we treat criticism of somebody's religious views as opposed to criticism of somebody's philosophical, political um, views outside of the realm where we consider them sacred or uh, I'm just looking for a way to draw this into the I still think it, I, I still think it's the fear of being accused of, religion, of, of racial bigotry, okay. which is the ultimate, uh, the ultimate um, thought crime. Uh, if you commit that, then you're, you're obviously flung out of the comity of civilized people, so that's the end. And people are very scared of that. And given the simple truth that large numbers of Muslims in Western countries do come from Asia, it's a very easy accusation to have made against you, and it's one people one, one people do fear. It's a very easy one to um, defuse, though, that, I think. And incidentally, I don't think racism is a thought crime. Mm -hmm. the, the preaching of racial hatred is is, is a offense if it's not a crime. Well, hang on, should, it, should, 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 it, should it be a criminal offense? That's no, no, but I mean, sure. no, is, and I mean, is, you know, I didn't say it, an, it should be a criminal offense. I mean, I always, is, I always thought offense, that, the, yeah. the, that the race relations laws in, in, it's in, not what people in, in Britain in the 60s were actually justified because they ended uh, the, 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 the posting of, of notices in, in, in boarding houses saying uh, no blacks and a number of other uh, rather disgraceful things. So I'm, I'm, I'm ambiguous about that, but it, it is... In, in terms of in, in, in terms of how we order our society, is something you cannot do, and it's something you can't think. The fact that you know, the, 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 whether that doesn't to, to call something a thought crime doesn't necessarily dignify it as something which you ought to think. No, indeed, but it's an utterance question. And when I say it's an offence, I mean it's an offence. It's offence to me, not an offence to the law. But it's um, it can have 
criminal implications of the asylum. But I, generally, I think everything should be both thinkable and sayable. And that, that principle matters more to me than, than the feelings of anyone who might be hurt by any violation of it. But um, it should be noticed that, in, again, speaking about the country I know best in Europe, my country of birth, um, the warnings of what was coming by way of uh, Islamist intolerance, by the way of the importing into Great Britain of uh, communities from the extremely backward and feudal and underdeveloped parts of North Africa and Pakistan. Uh, people who were arranged marriages to cousins down the generations and the terrible consequences such as deformed births and other come from our second nation. People like Nadim Aslam, for example, who's written this wonderful book about the Yorkshire Muslim community called Maps for Lost Lovers, or Hanif Qureshi, who wrote My Son the, um, my son, the Extremist, no, My Son the Terrorist, My Son the Fanatic, My Son the Fanatic, Hanif Qureshi. Um, Monica Ali, the author of Brick Lane, Salman Rushdie, most famously. All of these people were, were telling liberal Westerners, we come from these Muslim populations, we know what they're like. Don't you let them, don't you let them get away with this. And don't you let them guilt trip you into saying the criticism of this is racism. Don't let that happen to you. Well, we know what the first remark made by the director of our Centre of Intelligence was in the immediate post 9-11 uh, epoch, the first few seconds of it actually, because we know what he said. When the men run in, men ran in to tell him, Mr. Director, you better leave this meeting with Senator Boren. And it wasn't because he was late for his next one, and he had to watch on the television what had happened. And his first remark, the first remark made by our intelligence establishment in this era we're now in was the following. Gee, said Mr. Senate, I hope it's nothing to do with those guys in the flight schools in the Midwest. <laughs> Does this man deserve a Medal of Freedom, do you think, on his retirement? Should he not rather have been impeached? Should he not have at least been dismissed? Should he not, in fact, probably have been prosecuted for criminal negligence? No, because it must not be admitted. And therefore, it's left for us to face the fact that this is an army uh, a fight that's going to need volunteers. We cannot, in fact, delegate this to our leaders or complain when they get it wrong. It's going to call upon us. And the moment I want to reach is this, is when in the Arab press you start to read worried articles saying, do you realize that our extremist policies of terrorism and so on are creating huge forces of resistance in the West? We've really driven them now to a point where they're ready to fight. People all over the United States are signing up, saying, what can I do? How can I push back against jihad? Now look what we've done with our intervention in their internal affairs. That's when I'll know that we've turned this round. And do you feel, any of you, any sign of any of this mentality or self-respect or dignity in our society? I don't. But that's what I think we have to learn how to fight for. And we know who the enemy is. I'm not going to waste much time on that the vile combination of, in Islam of self-righteousness and self-hatred and self-pity. It's Trinity that we see every day. It's wrong for the president, it was wrong then for him to call it an attack on America, uh, to say that we were either with us, the Americans, or with the terrorists, or 80 nations represented in those towers that day. Several hundred of my fellow countrymen among them. I refused to go to a ceremony especially for people of English descent because I didn't want to go to anyone's uh, national or ethnic celebration. It was an attack on civilization itself, as should be very plain. And we should be very careful, I'm sorry, sir, to correct you slightly, of saying we have not been attacked since, because if we take that stand of civilization, we have been attacked almost every single day since then. Either in the form of our, our servicemen and women in Afghanistan and Iraq, whose performance I think is beyond praise, or the, the attack on the uh, the resort of Bali in Indonesia, attack on holidaymakers there, the regular attacks on Jewish uh, institutions and places of worship, ancient synagogues in Tunisia, in Turkey, in Morocco, all of these countries with governments that opposed the interventions in Afghanistan and in Iraq, by the way, uh, the attempt to blow up the London Underground, a facility used by many Americans every day, if you care, to put it like that. And in my opinion, most of all, I'm touched on, I was glad to see by Bill, um, the attempt in the fall of 2001, very underreported in our press, to blow up with a huge series of truck bombs the Parliament of India, the Lok Sabha in New Delhi, that represents, if you ever go and look at it, in all its splendor, the, the true <clears throat> parliamentary consummation of a genuine multi-ethnic, multicultural 
multi-religious uh, democracy based like ours on the rule of law, uh, the English language, uh, regular elections and the free market are, are, in my opinion, I submit, future closest ally and a country with which we have a great duty of solidarity. Every now and then, if you're like me and you go on the air and you debate with some whining, self-righteous, self-hating, self-pitying Muslim, and you tell him what you think of his Quran and his prophet, and so he says, you have offended a billion Muslims. You notice this? You notice that there's a slight tone of moral blackmail here, I sometimes think. Look, if it was a matter of defending the right of somebody to hold their religious opinion, I would defend the right of a Muslim if there were only three of them. The idea of a billion is clearly intended as a threat. It's a, there's a menace to that. You've upset a billion of us. You should watch out. That's what it means. And we're going to try and move in to your city and your country, too, and we're going to raise more and more demands. That's what's meant by it. But what about a billion Hindus? What about a billion Hindus who've been declared anathema, who have been declared fit for slaughter at any time, at any place? They're not even monotheist. Look what happened, for example, to the Nepalese guest workers in Iraq. Did anybody see that unbearable video of the mass slaughter and throat cutting of these Hindus? You have to see it to believe it, and the commentary that goes with it, too. And India is not just um, uh, Hindu. There are more Muslims living in India. Uh, in a democracy, in a, in a serious multicultural society, they live in Pakistan. We shouldn't despair. We have allies who've proved themselves ready to fight. Now, I mustn't trespass on the time I've decided to borrow from the extreme terseness of my two comrades here, <laughs> but I just wanted to say that uh, those of us who thought it would change everything were obviously wrong. For most of our countrymen, it has not done anything of the kind. They want reassurance. They even take part in opinion polls saying, I want a politician who makes me feel safer. Can anything be more contemptible than this exercise? And we suffer like the sugar in the, in the kidneys of a diabetic, as, as uh, Rebecca West called the moral atmosphere of the Chamberlain government, uh, from two very widespread illusions. First, that we ourselves are the cause of terrorism. Senator Harry Reid, I give you. Not at ran, not, I don't pick at random some extremist like Michael Moore or Ramsey Clark. The, the, the leader of the Democratic Party in the Senate says that, yes, it's true that Al-Qaeda is in Iraq. The only time on which, now it's obviously there and has gone to all the trouble of calling itself Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia. It's no longer denied that it's there, you notice. But it's only there because we are there says the Senate. He said it in, in, in a reply to a presidential broadcast. It was not an ill-considered or off-the-cuff remark. A prepared statement. Yes, Al-Qaeda's forces are in Iraq, but they are only there because of us. Defeat in the mind, surrender, capitulation, as well as a completely false statement of the case. As we well know, Mr. Zakawi and many of his associates were in Iraq long before the first coalition soldiers set foot there. Or an alternative argument made recently by Maureen Dowd in the New York Times that the problem is that we are in occupation of what she called Muslim land, denominating territory by religion, clearing the ground on the New York Times op-ed page for the caliphate to come. Well, this is a, this is a pretty uh, dire state of uh, moral surrender as well. And or we are told that if only we could drop the Jewish state off the back of the sled they'd leave us alone. Sometimes this is phrased as that Israel-Palestine is the crucial question of the solution, etc., etc. Well, everyone should know, and probably does, in this room, but I'll say it briefly, <clears throat> Al-Qaeda is an outfit that begins in Asia, not in the Middle East. It starts with trying to develop uh, by tearing out the territory of the Philippines, an independent Muslim state in the Philippine archipelago. It goes on to demand the return of East Timor, uh, which was nearly destroyed as a people uh, by Indonesian occupation to Muslim Indonesia. It blew up Sergio Vieira de Melio, the great Brazilian UN, UN envoy in Baghdad, and murdered him on his first week on duty for, uh, in, in revenge, as stated by Al-Qaeda, for his role in overseeing the independence of East Timor and the election that brought it to self-government. It wants to wrench Kashmir away from the Indian Union with the help of Pakistani subversion. If that was allowed to happen, the resulting bloodbath in the subcontinent would dwarf, absolutely dwarf, what we remember of the bloodletting of the partition of 1947-48, and would wreck and destroy the other great multicultural democracy in, and ally of ours in the world. It's quite a lot of concessions, in other words, that we're going to be asked to make. 
uh, in order to appease these people and to make sure they don't harbor any more evil thoughts against us. And in my opinion, half of Palestine won't quite satisfy them. And in my, in my other opinion, which I'll share with you, uh, nobody blows themselves up in a Jewish old people's home on Passover in Netanya on the Mediterranean coast of Israel proper, not in a settlement, not against the wall, not in an occupied territory. Nobody does that in order to bring about a compromise. It's just an instinct I have. <laughs> I have the feeling that they won't be happy until there are no more Jews in what used to be mandate Palestine. That's certainly what they say they want. I'm in favor of taking the enemy seriously to that extent. And on this question of let's not provoke, and that we are the cause of their reaction. Let us just examine this for one more second. All it takes in order to get the diplomatic immunity of a small Northern European democracy violated, its di diplomats are shot at, its embassies burned by crowds in the capital cities of countries that do not normally allow demonstrations. Uh, its trade ruined, its, its economy sabotaged, its nationals and the nationals of other Scandinavian countries threatened and killed randomly around the world. All that it takes is the refusal of the elected Prime Minister of Denmark to agree, waited upon as he was by a delegation of 20 Arab ambassadors, to break his own country's law and tell an afternoon newspaper in Copenhagen that it couldn't publish certain cartoons. That's all it takes to bring about jihadism now. That's the threshold of provocation. Now, you have to be, I think, a real masochist to say, well, then, we must avoid doing this kind of thing. Because all they're asking is that we change everything that makes our way of life different from theirs. And then it's true, I suppose, there would be very little to fight about. But in the meanwhile, I think that we have to face the fact that it's a clash of civilization, of course, and about civilization, and within a civilization. It does represent also, we, I, I think it's nice to be able to note, a war within Islam too, where we don't know how lucky we are that fighting on our side are forces of the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan and of the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan in Iraq, whose emblem I'm proud to wear in my lapel. People who are fighting against Saddam for us and taking heavy, heavy casualties when we thought his regime was a matter of indifference. And these people are just as Muslim and have just as good a right to claim that they observe that faith as do anyone else. We should never forget our duty of solidarity to them, and uh, they are our brothers and sisters in arms. And with the other victims of Bin Ladenism and this horrifying cult of death and murder and suicide that says that it loves itself and its cult more than we love life. Much depends then, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades, friends, much depends on the multiple ways in which we can disprove that assertion and, and assert the power of life and pluralism over, over the morbid, sordid, and medieval enemy uh, that we're now faced with. Thank you. A, a recent study by the Center for Strategic and in International Studies, I know that sounds like a bullshit organization. It is but a bullshit it, organization. <laughs> it is? Yeah. Why do you say that? I, I heard well, it was a very... It, I've been studying it for years. How much time have you got? <laughs> well, anyway... You can well, hardly pronounce its name. I've, been, I've known it for a long time. It is a bullshit organization. It's like the Lancet and the casualty figures. It's a junk science by okay, junk but, scholars. But, all right, tell me why I should believe... However, you're right on your premise. ...that they really want to fight us in Dollywood, but they're not... Well, let me give you an example. From Mr. Mr. Uh, Jefferson, since you asked me to mention my book, which I happily do, <laughs> available, fine books, still ever. Uh, in 1788, when the United States was barely a country... Right. Uh, ...was having its um, sailors taken as slaves by the Barbary states, the states of the Ottoman Empire in North Africa. Tripoli. Tripoli. The shores exactly. of Tripoli. The shores of Tripoli. And its people, uh, his, his ships uh, stopped, um, its crews carried off into slavery. We right. estimate one and a half million European and American slaves taken between 1750 and 1815. Jefferson and Adams went to their ambassador in London and said, why do you do this to us? The United States has never had a quarrel with the Muslim world of any kind. We weren't in the Crusades. We weren't in the war in Spain. Why do you do this to our people and our ships? Why do you plunder and enslave our people? And the ambassador said very plainly, Mr. Abdul Rahman said, because the Quran gives us permission to do so, because you are infidels. And that's our answer. And Jefferson said, well, in that case, I will send a navy 
which will crush your state, which he did, and a good thing, but there's too. A, I, the pro Islamic I, fundamentalism is not created by American democracy. It's a lie to say so. It's a masochistic lie, and it, and, it, and it excuses those who are the real criminals, and it blames us for the attacks made upon us. Don't have anything to do with this mentality. The argument that we're there fighting them so that they won't come and fight us is, is a equally a argument. ridiculous argument. Fight People, them everywhere. You ask anyone in London this everywhere. summer whether they felt that the attacks weren't coming to them, and they'd have said, no, that argument's absurd, of course, that they are going to be attacking all over the world, be it Morocco, <coughs> yeah. Istanbul, London, and those and countries... I, and Mr Blair says, we'll fight them everywhere is, they do. Is there not a difference between... We'll fight them everywhere they do. I, I know they hate us anyway. I agree. They hate us anyway. But there's oh, a big difference course. between... Who, who hates you? Muslims hate you? Well, I think everybody in the world hates us now. <laughs> Well, it's not just okay. this, is the, but this, this is the point, Bill, that uh, 10,000 new Bin Ladens have been created by the policy that your country has adopted. What kind of Ladens? Bin Ladens. Oh, Bin Ladens. 10,000 new Bin Ladens have been created because of the policy that has been followed. And this is uh, the biggest test of a policy. Has it made things better or made things worse? And my belief is that Muslims are not angry with us because of who or what we are, but because of what we do. They're angry with us because of our support for Sharon's Israel, principally. Do you know that every one of those settlers in the Gaza Strip got a quarter of a million dollars to leave land they should never have been on in the first place, and you paid for it? Well, I would argue United with you States about that. Paid do, you think, for it. do you really think that if America pulled all of its bases out of Saudi Arabia, um, we did. Fulfilled, we did. The, fulfilled we, all the conditions that Al Qaeda has said in the past that it wanted. That suddenly you'd see no more Al Qaeda I, attacks around I, I'm the world. The la I don't I, I'm that. I'm not advocating negotiating with Bin Laden and Al Qaeda. I want you to negotiate. Why not? With, I want you to negotiate with the Muslims who haven't joined them yet, but who might join them tomorrow or the next day. But I like the people that you need me, to, uh, Mr. Mar, I have to. If, if you let me say this, I, I won't want to say anything more on this show. Uh, what Mr. Galloway has just said is quite false. Um, what, Mr. Galloway uh, trades a better set of manners when he's in Los Angeles from the one that he exhibits when he's in, say, uh, Syria on state television when he praises the martyrs and the jihadists and the 150 or so operations they conduct every day in Iraq. He goes there to stir it up and then he comes here to tell us, watch out, they're being nasty. That's, I think, disgraceful. Wow, that's what Arafat used to do. And then if, it seems to me that, um, it seems to me, I don't know if it does to you, Mr. Bin Laden is a kind of one-of-a-kind guy. I don't think there are 10,000 people like him. And if they're clones of him, suppose there are that many clones, where does he come from? What did American policy do to make him declare American war on us? American policy invented him. Would exist no, no, I mean, I, I'm astounded at that. It was the United States who invented bin Laden. They sent him to Afghanistan. They gave him money and guns. Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, the president who was being praised by your uh, on the one hand, but on the other author a minute ago. We Ronald were... Reagan paid for bin Laden. But He's we, the one who sent him to Afghanistan. The, You've made cool. this Frankenstein monster of right. Islamist fundamentalism. What? Now you want to but punish the Afghans <laughs> for a guy that the, you sent there. The Afghans had the right to fight against the Soviet invasion of their country, which Mr. Galloway supported. That's the first thing. The second thing is the CIA did not invent Mr. Bin Laden. Can we talk about Bin Laden, Bin Laden instead of me? Mr. Bin Laden was sent sui generis by a Saudi yes, group. Yes, unhealthy you, personal the, obsession the only, with the only, the only, uh, <laughs> Can we talk about the issue? Well, it's, unhealthy. it's unhealthy to have to consider, Mr. Nobody Galloway. Nobody here even like knows that. me. Why it's don't we talk about bin Laden? <laughs> and talk about Al-Qaeda? Talk about well, We're the not issues. going to talk about him as if he's our fault, Mr. Galloway, however slimily you put Power? it. Are you in the United States, We're not man, going man? to blame him. For, we're not going to blame ourselves for... I love it when the British fight. It's... But it's... Uh, <laughs> it's uh, there's nothing British There's about only it. one better fight, and that's a chick there's fight. I think British we about, all know there's that. There's nothing British about <laughs> Mr. Galloway. He's a fifth column run from the Middle East uh, in British politics. Wow. And oh, yeah. it is quite false to say that anyone protesting against General Sharon's policy in Gaza or anywhere else in Israel would decide, let's grab a couple of plane loads of American civilians and fly them into a couple of buildings full of American and international civilians. General Sharon wasn't the but, Prime Minister of Israel at the time. Mr. Clinton was trying to negotiate a deal with uh, Mr. Barak yeah. and Mr. Arafat at the time when those, when those people landed in our country and began their conspiracy against us. Anyone who says that we're to blame for it is carrying no, no, no water for the people that, who committed the crime. I'm just getting at how to that. be safer. And that, you you talked that. about the hijackers. They found out that of the hijackers, only the guys who were actually flying the planes had completely shaved their bodies. In other words, they were ready to meet their maker and get the virgins. The other guys, they think, because they weren't shaved, were duped into the mission. They didn't know it was a suicide mission. They thought they were going to Disneyland. 
So that tells me that they couldn't, must, they couldn't even muster up 19 people who wanted to go on a suicide mission. Like I say, there's one thing to hate us. It's another thing, how many people can you get to take action? And I'm worried that this war in Iraq is the thing because it's a Christian you army in a Muslim running, land you running, you that makes them out, take running out of suicide no, bombers? They are certainly not running out of suicide bombers in Iraq. What you hear Crazy now is that they're having, in Iraq, no. In Iraq, no. That people they're having, they have so many people now willing to be suicide bombers that what you're hearing is that they have not only one person in the vehicle that's driving the explosives, so, they've got a person alongside them because they so have the so many people fit. And they sent, to go they sent a Down syndrome girl. Somebody riding yeah. shotgun? They sent a Down syndrome girl with a. They sent a Down syndrome girl with a backpack to toddle into. An election uh, 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 so poll booth in Baghdad. Well, that's yeah. it. Now I hate them. Right. So no, the policy is, before so I was iffy on suicide bombers, Chris, but out. now you've no, uh, they won't run out. No. By the way, what they should have well, done? They should have consulted the Israeli line and the Talmudic line on this because they would have found that with every 72 virgins that they get in paradise, they also get 72 mothers-in-law. So perhaps, <laughs> perhaps He's in the end, a joke. perhaps in the end, perhaps in the end, uh, perhaps in the end, perhaps in the end, perhaps in the end, you'll worry about the um, them running out of uh, suicide uh, murderers will um, be well, justified. Okay, but should we negotiate with terror? I mean, George Bush said a while ago, he said there is no way to make peace with those whose only goal is death. And I would submit that their goal isn't death. Death is their method, as is anyone in a war. And by our own definition of terrorism, which is purposely killing civilians, America has been terrorists. We purposely killed lots but of civilians in, Europe, in Hiroshima have, and, and Dresden. We have years mm -hmm. of history in Europe of negotiating with various terrorist organizations. Right, the IRA. ETA. Um, the Red Brigade, but those were organizations that had specific demands. They had specific territorial requests, and there was a framework in which you could negotiate. They had a set of demands, and you could negotiate with those demands. Al-Qaeda is different. There is something non-negotiable with about Al-Qaeda. I don't believe that there is a set of demands that Osama bin Laden could true? come up yeah. with no. and that we could tick we off look, and look, suddenly look, say, look, okay, look, it's look, all over, the jihad fish, is over. Fish need water in which to swim. The water in which these fish are swimming is created by the perceived injustice of our policy towards the Muslim world, towards the Israel-Palestine question, towards the propping up of the corrupt kings and puppet presidents of the Arab world, uh, towards the whole issue of Iraq. This is the water in which these people swim. That's what we have to dry up if we're going to deal with these people. But on the subject of terrorism, why, Bill, George, Bill why do you have Florida, a Florida, is, full, in that Florida case? is full of people who have harbored terrorist designs upon Cuba for almost 40 years. And nobody's kicking them out of Florida. In fact, they're part and parcel of the Republican <coughs> Party machine in Florida that keeps Jeb Bush, the president's brother, in power. Well, absolutely. What could be more clever than that? And, um, <laughs> and of course, in, if, in Afghanistan, we've only, by uh, creating a free country which has regular elections, we've only made Muslims angry at us. And by helping East Timor to become independent of a Muslim dictatorship in Indonesia, we've obviously upset uh, Muslim fanatics. And this is nonsense. And by, by, by helping the Israelis to evacuate Gaza, we've brought Muslim wrath upon us by the president saying that Islam is a religion of peace, he's incited war. Uh, we, and it goes back, as I said, to the, the, the initial beginnings of Islamic fundamentalism. The first attack on this country was in 1788 by Muslims who said, the Quran gives us the right to punish and enslave infidels. That is bin Laden's ideology. Bin Laden wants the rest restoration of the caliphate. What do you think the caliphate they, uh... is an empire. He's pro-empire, not anti-imperialist. What do you think they he think thinks when half they... The, when half they... the people in the world all the female half are slaves already. He's, a, he's a, for the banning of all music, all books, all philosophy. Uh, so I'm, so I'm this guessing... is because he cares about the Palestinians? No, no. Anyone who believes this is a fool. No, no at best. Nobody's talking, nobody's talking here for bin Laden. I'm talking about the people who might support him tomorrow. Water. I'm talking about the people who are so angry that they're being drawn to this obscurantist, medieval savagery of bin Ladenism. And I'm saying, let's draw, let's... Let's drain the swamp of hatred out of which these people are feeding. The time to That's say the that. The I'm time to say that would have been. The time to say that would have been to oppose the Red Army. If Mr. Galloway believed a word of that, which he doesn't, it would, the time Can to say we? it would have been. I have to, one minute before new rules. Anyone have anything to say Army? about Kate Moss? <laughs> yes. <laughs>
Uh, if you examine the record of the so-called anti-war movement in this country and imagine what would have happened had its council been listened to over the last 15 and more years, you would have a world in which the following would be the case. Saddam Hussein would be the owner and occupier of Kuwait. He would have succeeded in the annexation, not merely the invasion, but the abolition of an Arab and Muslim state that was a member of the Arab League and of the United Nations. And with these resources, as we now know, because he lost that war, he was attempting to equip himself with the most terrifying arsenal that it was possible for him to lay his hands on. That's one consequence of anti-war politics. That's what would have happened. In the meanwhile, Slobodan Milosevic would have made Bosnia part of a greater Serbia, and Kosovo would have been ethnically cleansed and also annexed. Uh, the Taliban would be still in power in Afghanistan if the anti-war movement had been listened to, and Al-Qaeda would still be their guests. And Saddam Hussein, with his crime family, would still be privately holding ownership over a terrorized people in a state that's been most aptly, aptly described as a concentration camp above ground and a mass grave underneath it. Now, if I had that record politically, I would be extremely modest. I wouldn't be demanding explanations from those of us who said it's about time that we stop this continual capitulation to dictatorship, to racism, to aggression, and to totalitarian ideology that we will not allow to be repeated in Iraq, the failures in Rwanda and in Bosnia and in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And we take pride in having taken that position, and we take pride in our Iraqi and Kurdish friends who are conducting this struggle, on our behalves, I should say. Now, I could have said this in front of any audience and against any antagonist, but in my last two minutes, I will have to say that I believe it is a disgrace that a member of the British House of Commons should go before the United States Senate subcommittee and not testify, but decline to testify, and to insult all those who try to ask him questions with the most vile and cheap gutter snipe abuse. I think that's a disgrace. And I've got one minute. I've got one minute. I've got one minute. And it is worse, it is worse than a disgrace. If you That's not coming, that's not coming out of my time. If you knew how you looked and sounded, comrades, when you do that. <laughs> well, you, the cameras can take care of it. That's not coming out of my time. It is not just a disgrace, it is a crime that Mr. Gaddafi has profited from the theft of money from the Iraqi Oil for Food program, has told continuous lies about his profiteering from it and the foul associates that he made at a time when Iraqi children were dying and 11 billion from this program, 11 billion, went to the murderer and criminal and sadist and fanatic Saddam Hussein. To how can anyone who's a business partner of this regime show their face in a city like this and not content with it? Not content with it. Not content with it. He turns up in Damascus. The man's search for a tyrannical fatherland never ends. The Soviet Union's let him down. Albania's gone. The Red Army's out of Afghanistan and Czechoslovakia. The hunt persists. Saddam has been overthrown, and his criminal connections with him have been exposed. But on to the next, on the 30th of July, in Damascus in Syria, appearing, I've given it all to you in a piece of paper, in front of Mr. Assad, whose death squads are cutting down the leaders of democracy in Lebanon, as this is going on, to tell the Syrian people they're fortunate to have such a leader. The slobbering Dauphin, who they got because he's the son of the slobbering tyrant who came before him. How anyone with a teacher of socialist principle can act or speak in this way is beyond me, and I hope, ladies and gentlemen, far beyond you and far beneath your contempt. Thank you. Well, I think it's, I can say that it's a sort of a pleasure to be um, insulted by Mr. Galloway under any of my identities. Um, I've never made a speech at a journalist's conference in uh, Dundee, for example. I don't know who does Mr. Galloway's research, though I think I can Eamon McCann, he said it on I've radio. never, said I've it never. On radio in New I, York on Saturday. Eamon McCann, remember him? I remember Eamon McCann very well. Uh, by the way, he gives me the opportunity to say that I've been a lifelong supporter of the reunification of Ireland and with Edward Said in uh, the early years of the Intifada, as early as 86, published a book which you can still get from uh, New Left Books, Versa, called Blaming the Victims, about the, uh, the struggle for, for the full establishment of Palestinian rights. Um, and yes, it's true that I was an opponent of the last Gulf War. I don't know why anyone thought 
that to make such a point was a point against me. I dare say I might not have been invited here in this, this battle of the titans <laughs> if, if it wasn't tolerably well known that I think I was probably mistaken on that occasion. If you can assimilate a point as, sim as simple as that, ladies and gentlemen, which I dare say you can, for I shan't insult you, then I think you'll have to notice something about what Mr. Galloway just said and the, re the rhetorical, I won't say trick, I would say squalid maneuver that underlies it. To hear him speak, you would think, would you not, that he was a pacifist, that he defines himself as anti-war. Now, how can this be said in good conscience by someone who has just, standing by the side of the dictator of Syria, on the 30th of July, referred to the 154 heroic operations conducted in Iraq by the so-called resistance, a resistance that's run, as we know, by a senior bin Ladenist and by many of the former secret police of the Ba'athist regime. How can someone say, and say they're anti-war and they care about casualties, that they praise 154 operations a day? 145. I ask you. 145. He's coming down a bit. Um, oh, that's what it says it's in your leaflet. That, it's not that it many. It says 145 let me, in let your me, leaflet. Let me, let me remind you of what some of those operations were. Uh, the blowing up by military-grade explosives of the headquarters of the United Nations in Baghdad a few months after the intervention, as it was being tenanted by Sergio Di Miello, one of the great international civil servants of our time, who was fresh from, Amy knows more about this than I, but fresh from his role in the very belated supervision of the independence of East Timor from Indonesia and of the holding of a free election in East Timor. And the jihadists who murdered him put out a communique saying, we have today put an end to the life of this disgusting man because he freed Timor from Muslim holy land in Indonesia. These people are not pacifists, ladies and gentlemen, nor are they anti-imperialists. If you haven't noticed, they call for the restoration of a lost empire, the caliphate, and the imposition of Sharia law on all non-believers within its borders. That's not pacifism. That's not anti-imperialism. And to praise the people who do this, to sully the name of Charles James Fox, ladies and gentlemen, with such a squalid, with such a squalid uh, enterprise of brigandage and conquest is truly revolting. It's almost as funny as Michael Moore saying that the, the Zarqawiite resistance in Iraq is for him the same as the Minutemen of the American Revolution. There comes a point, and I think it's come by now, where what people say is self-discrediting, requires no more comment from me. Now, among the people killed by these heroic operations in Iraq, some of them run from Syria and paid for by the human toothbrush and slobbering Dauphin Assad, Mr. Galloway's new pal, among the victims of these, of these operations was specialist Casey Sheehan, who was trying to clean up the festering slum of what had once been called Saddam City and was now known to us as Sada City, where the water supply is coming back on. It's taking a while because people keep blowing it up, but it's coming back on. Now, I will put a simple moral proposition to you and see if I've phrased it aright. Is it not rather revolting to appear in Damascus by the side of Assad and to praise the people who killed Casey Sheehan and then to come to America and appeal to the emotions of his mother? I, I, I say sincerely, I didn't think it could get as low as that. And yes, I did criticize the, the luckless Mrs. Sheehan because he, she had made a very unfortunate political statement suggesting that she agreed with Mr. Bin Laden that George Bush was the murderer of her son, which is not. The son, the son, you exculpate the murderer, you exculpate the killers, right there. They didn't kill him. Shame on you. Shame on you for saying that. There are probably some people among you here who fancy yourself as having leftist revolutionary credentials. In fact, I can tell that you do from the zoo noises you make <laughs> and, the, and the scars you can demonstrate from your long underground twilight struggle against Dick Cheney. But while you're masturbating in that manner, the Iraqi secular left, the socialist and communist movements, the workers' movement, the trade unions are fighting for their lives against the most vicious and indiscriminate form of fascist violence that any country in the region has seen for a very long time. And the full intent of that, the full intent of that was, and I'll say it directly, yes, yes in Fallujah, was to establish a Taliban regime and, and, a, and a safe house for Al-Qaeda. That's what we were facing. You think you could fight that without casualties? You're irresponsible. You're ahistorical. We take, on this side of the house, without conditions, we take our side, 
with the struggle of the Iraqi democratic and secular left against fascism, we make no apology. Those who have betrayed their own party, Mr. Galloway had to be expelled from the great labor movement of which I was, I'm myself still a member, uh, because of advocating the shooting, publicly advocating jihad against British troops, now turns on the Iraqi left and wishes them well as they as, and wishes and argues and hopes for their defeat by an onslaught which would make Afghanistan uh, seem like a civilized country. What two positions can one take about this? I invite you to consider, ladies and gentlemen, and, and consider carefully, and thank you. I believe they emerged out of a swamp of hatred created by us. I believe, I believe, I believe, but I believe, no, no. I believe, I believe, I believe that by, I believe. I believe. I believe. Please, please, please. I believe. It's also, I think, a bit much to be told that uh, these Al Qaeda chaps, these uh, killers and sadists and um, nihilists and um, producers of indiscriminate explosions, wouldn't be this way if we weren't so mean to them. Now, it's true some of them, Mr. Zarqawi, their leader, of course, the bin Ladenist leader, uh, was in Iraq before, and was well known to have been in Iraq under the rule of Saddam Hussein. And I can tell you that no one gets in and out of Iraq at that level without the president knowing. And it's also true that a group affiliated with him, the Ansar al-Islam, a fundamentalist group, thought that its main job was to kill the Kurdish leadership in northern Iraq, the elected leadership, which is a strange target, I think, for a holy war. And it's also true that some of them came to Iraq after we threw them out of Afghanistan. Well. That's easy then. Leave them in control of Afghanistan. Don't mess around with these people. Don't make them angry. Don't make them mean. It's your fault. Now, this is masochism, uh, but it's being offered to you by sadists. Okay. <laughs> and someone who hasn't answered my question and my challenge. I said in round terms when I opened that this is not just a matter of which of us can be the rudest, because I already conceded that to Mr. Galloway. <laughs> or which of us can be the most cerebral, because he's already conceded that to me. <laughs> but I said that there's a further grudge between us, which is this. I say that Mr. Galloway discussed the allocation of oil for food profits that stole directly from the Iraqi people and that helped to corrupt the scheme and uh, program of the United Nations. I say he discussed that personally with Mr. Tariq Aziz in Baghdad at least once. And if he will put his name to an affidavit that formally denies that, we can have done with this business. But if he does not, it's going to haunt him on every, every stop of this tour and all the way back to England and everywhere he goes to raise the flag of jihad in the Middle East. <laughs> this I promise you, I promise you. Now the fact is there was no uh, uh, invasion by George Bush of Iraq, nor was there any UN mandate to do so. I'm talking about 1991. It wasn't an invasion of Iraq. It was an expulsion of Iraq from Kuwait by a coalition which included even Syria. Now, if Mr. Assad can change his mind on this, and um, I can, um, and many other people too, I suppose we have to congratulate you on being absolutely 100% consistent in your support for unmentionable thugs and criminals. Christopher Hitchens, when do you think the U.S. troops should leave Iraq? Um, I think I can be as precise, though perhaps not as terse as Mr. Galloway on this point. Um, and so I should thank him, by the way, for eliciting or allowing, allowing me to elicit, or you perhaps, ladies and gentlemen, to elicit from him um, what I feared, but uh, didn't hope, but in other words, a full declaration of support for the campaign of sabotage and murder and beheading uh, that has taken the lives of brave journalists, that demolished, demolished the offices, demolished the offices, Demolish the offices of the United Nations. Demolish Other the no offices, depths to which you will not the offices sink. of the United Nations and the Other Red Cross. Other any depths to which you will not sink. Shot down, shot down senior clerics outside their places of worship and continues as a campaign of mayhem to this day. Other no it depths will be, to which you will not sink. You've fallen out of the you gutter might into both the sewer. To, you might all care to remember. You've fallen out of the gutter into the sewer. You might all care to remember that you are being televised, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I trust your mothers are not watching. You're shouting at me down. 
so I can answer the question. You, I'm clear on the concept. Um, I will proceed if I'm allowed to, but I'm just reminding you, you're on telly, okay? Just hope your friends and relatives aren't watching. Now, this, a, campaign of, a, campaign, a campaign of mayhem and sabotage that was most obviously directed, and here's where I want to move to my point, in February last, uh, against the only attempt that Iraq has ever seen to hold a national election to provide a, a parliament, a constitution, and an elected government. Now, what are the odds, do you think, that those who are blowing up the offices of the UN and who recently shot down a senior Sunni cleric in Baghdad because he too wants an end to the occupation but he asked his congregation to vote in the upcoming elections. What are the odds that these people represent the secret silent majority in Iraq as say the FLN did in Algeria? Um, well, let's just do some simple, relatively simple arithmetic. Um, in the three Kurdish provinces of Iraq there is really not a single sympathizer either of the Ba'ath Party or of Al-Qaeda. It can be taken as a certainty that we know at least 20% of the population consider this resistance to be a fascist pest and have committed their heroic armed forces because there is a rebel army in Iraq. There is a people's army. There is a guerrilla force in Iraq. It's called the Peshmerga. It's the, it's the People's Liberation Army of Kurdistan. And it fights on our side. And we at last, because Mr. Galloway is right that our policy in the past has been heinous, we at last fight on their side too. Excellent. Now, very well, moving right along. It is admitted, I don't think it's even denied by the egregious figure of uh, Professor Cole, um, who's never set foot in the region, though claims to speak Farsi and various other languages. I don't believe it's denied even by him, and he changes his mind on these things about once a week, that Ayatollah Sistani, Grand Ayatollah Sistani, is uh, considered by the majority of the Iraqi Shia to be, their, let's say, at least their spiritual leader. If it had been up to Grand Ayatollah Sistani, and if you like, if it had been up to my advice too, Mr. Paul Bremer would have had to call elections much earlier than he did, and so he should have done, and make a transfer of sovereignty much sooner than he did, and so he should have done. But we have no reason to doubt that the forces that favor this transition to a federal democratic system in Iraq where no one group rules by violence or terror or by dictatorship, where there is federal and local autonomy and where disputes are not settled by violence is favored by the latent majority of the Iraqi people. Because if that's not so, it's very easy for them to participate in the vote. And what they do instead is they try and sabotage it. I think that's a very eloquent campaign that's being run by Mr. Galloway's heroic resistance now to stop these elections from happening. To, to speak to the people, the terrified people who have been through three and a half decades of war and fascism and terror and never give them a moment to breathe, never give them a moment's freedom from fear and intimidation. Shame on the people. Shame on the people who call this a liberation movement. Mm. Now, uh, uh, Mr. Galloway came a, a, a little near the knuckle a moment ago and decided to overlook it. He said what I said was bordering on racist. I, I really feel I'm entitled to ask him to withdraw that imputation. I think that's an appropriate thing to say. But I will have to add that for people to start pumping out propaganda before the bodies had even been uncovered in New Orleans saying, and, and, and to make points, demagogic often, saying they wouldn't be dead if they weren't black, about people who haven't been identified yet, whose parents don't know where they are. And to say this wouldn't have happened if we weren't wasting money on Arabs, that, that is an appeal to the most base provincial, isolationist, and chauvinist mentality. You're on TV. Do I get the same question? I don't mind. Would, would you like to close with that? Um, on Sharia. <laughs> uh, it really is. I, I find no, it's, okay. it's I like a big question. I like uh, surprises. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, Sharia just means law. I mean, all people say Sharia law, uh, making a, an elementary mistake. And of course, it, it's not the case that every thief has their hand lopped off in Muslim society or every adulterer gets stoned. And, so, and, I'm, and I'm perfectly sure that's not just because it would diminish the labor force so uh, <laughs> radically uh, or, or uh, uh, so to speak, disable it. Um, I think it's more because of something I've claimed to notice elsewhere, which is the religion is man-made. And so there are enormous discrepancies in 
how these things are promulgated and also how they are enforced. Um, and the, most countries and societies come quite early and easily to the conclusion that their own religions are, in, in one form or another, uh, not, not really practicable. Um, the same, I mean, after all, in, um, in Saudi Arabia, a woman can't even drive a car, whereas in Iran, she can vote. Not for much, but she can, <laughs> as much as a man can, let's say. Her, her vote can be stolen and degraded as much as, uh, as her husband's or her brother. <laughs> Of, there's, an infinite, there's an infinite variation. I, I don't know. It, it, I can't shake what I, was, what I heard, saw once on the BBC from someone whose career in London I followed. I don't know if you know him. You wouldn't like him. Um, Anjam Chowdhury. He's a well, very well-known noisemaker around, around London complaining about secularism, Judaism, all this kind of thing. And he's, he's been in trouble with the law a few times. And... Um, was interviewed on the BBC, uh, went on about how nothing would change until the green flag of Islam was flying over Downing Street and Buckingham Palace and so forth. And was asked, I thought quite mildly by the BBC interviewer, said, well, if, you, if this is the way you feel about Sharia and about a total Islamic rule, wouldn't you feel happier moving to a country where they already had it? And which is, just, I mean, a polite question, but a rather cheap one, I mean, uh, but still. I, what didn't prepare me for the answer? Chowdhury looked straight at the guy and straight into the camera and said, what makes you think this is your country? <laughs> I thought it was a very good question. Now, why do you feel, I, know, I think I know partly why you feel, why do you feel it's necessary to affirm that? And of course a Muslim will, should learn the language, should obey the laws, uh, should observe, observe the customs and so on. I mean, why, most immigrants don't feel they, so to speak, absolutely have to say that. The answer, I suspect, is that it's embarrassing to notice that in places like as far apart as Sweden and as Spain, there are groups of people who say their countries should be part of the caliphate and that that's why they've come here. And if it wasn't for those people, um, you wouldn't be in this position. So it seems to me that uh, to be, in order to be consistent, you should, you should fear them and dislike them find them morally and intellectually repulsive, at least as much as, if not more, than I do. And I don't say that you don't, but I do think that that is, that is the urgent uh, priority. On the lady's question about where would be the best uh, country to live if you were um, a, a Muslim and wanting to be a member of a sexual or gender minority, or I think she said a female or a homosexual. Um, so hard to confuse. Um, <laughs> actually, the easiest, the easiest place for, for you to, to live in that case would probably be, I was thinking about it while Professor Ramadan was talking, would probably be, this will be my closing statement, would almost certainly be either Bosnia-Herzegovina or Kosovo. Uh, culturally, culturally Muslim, uh, democratic, uh, open societies in southern and Balkan Europe that were saved from obliteration by the power of the United States, which has never had a word of thanks for what it did in that moment. And which remains a secular country with a godless constitution. <laughs> That's a note which on which, the, that's a note which on which the, we can end. Which is the last best hope of humanity. Thank you. <laughs>